Hey, are you hungry right now? Then order some food using Grubhub. Grubhub is the best way to connect hungry diners with their favorite local restaurants. Search, order, and eat without ever picking up the phone. Order online or through the Grubhub app. And best of all, it's free to use. Go to Grubhub.com slash WTF and use the code PODCAST during checkout to get 5 bucks off your first order over $10. That's Grubhub.com slash WTF. Use the code PODCAST at checkout. We're also sponsored today by LegalZoom. If you're starting a business, forming an LLC, or getting a will, LegalZoom will provide the personal attention you need and help take care of the details. LegalZoom is not a law firm, but provides self-help services at your specific direction. Visit LegalZoom.com and enter the discount code WTF for more savings. That's LegalZoom.com. All right, let's do the show. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers, what the fuck buddies, what the fuck nears, what the fuck nicks, what the fucksters, what the fucksables? I'm recording this on the eve of my colonoscopy. That's the way this is going to go. I haven't eaten all day. I drank one bottle of this stuff. I think I'm, I'm empty. I'm clear. There's nothing going on in me. Zero. Feels great. I'm purged. I'm lethargic. I, I can still, I got the energy, man. I can still give it to you. This is Mark Marin, if you're wondering. Today is Ivan Reitman Day on WTF. We had Jason Reitman on, on, uh, Monday show, and now his father, Ivan Reitman, who has made some great comedies over the years and has a, a film called Draft Day with Kevin Costner, which I saw. And I don't know anything about football, and I got, I got choked up, got choked up and jerked around and excited. That's a, you know, that's what it's supposed to do. Cosner was pretty fucking great. I'll tell you that right now. And, uh, you know, he, he's not always great, but he was good in this movie. Why am I talking up the movie? Because I saw the movie. I'm going to talk to Ivan Reitman, but I'm going to talk to him about Animal House. I'm going to talk to him about Meatballs and Stripes and, and Dave and Ghostbusters and, you know, where all that, it's all going to happen. We're going to talk about his son. It was interesting talking to his son, Jason, and, you know, getting a heads up on a couple of things and getting Ivan's angle on it. This is real showbiz, folks. These are real showbiz people. This is big-time showbiz Ivan Reitman. He's a big-time movie director. He changed the course of modern movie comedies. What else do I want to tell you before I get into stuff? Uh, my book in paperback, Attempting Normal, available wherever you buy books. I will be in Raleigh, North Carolina, tomorrow night, the 18th and 19th. I will be in Raleigh at Good Nights. Come down. I'm also going to do a couple more shows at the Trippany House at the Steve Allen Theater. That's uh, Tuesday the 22nd. And Tuesday the 29th, I threw those on there to uh, to have some more fun. It was thrilling to have uh, Ivan Reitman in here. He's a, he's a huge director. And a lot of times, I've had a lot of big people on the show, but I don't get to talk to a lot of directors. And talking to Jason and Ivan Reitman was uh, was special for me uh, in the sense that uh, this is it's big time showbiz. Why am I hitting that? Why am I hammering it? Why am I telling you that twice? Because I was in Cleveland uh, last weekend, and I had an experience that uh, I, I'm not sure what it signified. I, I'm not quite clear on it. It definitely had a profound meaning to me, and it seemed to be a signifier for everything wrong in show business and entertainment, or perhaps everything that was that is wrong in the world. It was some sort of hitting bottom. It, it, it's, it seemed I witnessed show business... Hitting bottom. Let me explain to you. Look, I've done a lot of uh, a lot of radio in my life. I've I've hosted a radio show. I'm by no means a radio veteran, but as a comic, I've done a lot of morning radio with morning radio people. I've been in some awkward situations. I've been in some. You never know what's going to happen on a morning radio show. I've been in some awkward porn situations. I've been in some awkward, slightly racist situations. I've been in some awkward contest situations. I've had awkward conversations, but that is sort of part and parcel for morning radio. Now, shocking stuff is shocking stuff. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's done well. Sometimes it's just, uh, stupid. And sometimes it's utterly pointless. But I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm 50 years old that when I got to the radio station in Cleveland, I'm not even going to mention show, the show. It doesn't matter. Something was going on. You know, we're waiting in a hallway to go into a radio studio and out of a studio, uh, a, a short man, uh, in his underwear comes running out and running down the hall. He needs a bucket or something. So now I know, like, all right, something, 
is going on. And I'm a little irate because there's part of me that thinks like, what, what am I walking into? Yeah, it's not even that they're trying to sandbag me. It's just they're, they're, they're trying to sandbag everything I represent as a functioning human being by whatever the fuck is going on in that room. So I didn't get too freaked out. I'm like, all right, I'll play along. But then, a uh, producer or someone involved with the show comes up and uh, walks us into a room to show us the the uh, the live cam of the studio, which is completely covered in plastic tarp. So something something big is going to go on. These guys have been planning something. They're up to something. It's going to be spectacular, right? So then the guy pulls me out and he starts talking to me about what's going to happen. He says, "Well, we've got a vomit cannon. You're gonna you're going after the vomit cannon, but I think it's going to be all right." And I'm like, I'm not going in there after a fucking vomit cannon. I didn't say that, but I'm like, that, really? Of what is a vomit cannon? Apparently, these guys have put a couple of days' work into reconfiguring a leaf blower uh, and hooking a funnel up to it, so one guy could drink a bunch of milk and vomit into the funnel as it sprays all over the the guy in his underwear and in his mouth and stuff. I know what you're thinking, folks. You're probably thinking like, man, that sounds amazing. Did that go well? No, it didn't go well. And no, it doesn't sound amazing. First of all, it's like that jackass stuff has been jackass. And they can do it because they got a sort of punk rock spirit to it. There's some creativity to it. This was utterly fucking pointless. And it was just one of those moments where I'm like, well, this is show business. This is this realm, this level, which is the bottom of show business. I'd hit the bottom of show business that day. Look, if that's what they want to do, that's fine. But I'm a 50-year-old grown-ass man, and now I'm wondering if I'm going to walk into a, a, a puke storm. So, of course, they, they do the puke cannon. They, 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 they fire off the, the, the vomit cannon. And the, uh, the one place they didn't cover was the ceiling, which is exactly where all the vomit went to because whatever they did to the leaf roller, who knew it was not made to blow vomit out of it. There was some engineering problem. The 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 tragic man-child geniuses who reconfigured the, the leaf blower to be a vomit cannon, I don't know, they missed something. So now there's vomit all over the ceiling and there's dripping white vomit from the ceiling. So what did I do? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I did. I said, I, I don't want to go in there. The entire hallway smells like puke. And it's just, it's awful. This is like, what, what are you doing? And they're like, well, wait, they're figuring it out. They're figuring it out, man. They're going to put you in another studio. All right. So I go in the other studio and the guy who hosts the show, he's a, he's a good radio guy. We did a very good interview. He's, you know, he's good. Good morning guy. And I go, what are you doing? What the hell are you doing with the vomit cannon? And he's like, well, you know, we just do stuff like, uh, like stuff you think about when you were younger that you, you just like, if you were younger, wouldn't you think that was cool? And I'm like, no, not in a fucking million years would I even think to do that. First of all, you don't even need the leaf forward. Just let the guy puke in the other guy's mouth if you want to have that weird <laughs> psycho homoerotic freak show going on. Just let the two guys in their underwear vomit in each other's mouths. What do you need a leaf blower for? At least it's more intimate like that. I didn't say all that. I said, no, I don't think I would have thought of that. I, I just don't know how it felt. It just felt like it was, it was, it was just desperate and stupid, which is fine, but who cares? And why has it come to that? I followed a vomit cannon. I can put that on my resume. That's all I'm saying. All right. Exercise is good for us. We go to the gym to take care of our bodies, or at least we should, but we should also work out another important asset, our brain. Lumosity.com can help. It's like an online gym for your brain. Lumosity has scientifically designed brain games customized to help train your memory. They challenge your attention and problem-solving skills. They're fun, and they only take a few minutes every day. Track your progress online and compare yourself to other people. Plus, you can play Lumosity from anywhere, your computer, your iPad, or your iPhone with the free Lumosity app. So have fun, work out your brain, and make Lumosity part of your everyday routine. I've been using it because I'm afraid of losing my mind. Start training your brain today. Go to Lumosity.com, click the Start Training button, then start playing your first game. That's Lumosity.com, and tell them you heard it on WTF. I don't know if I did justice to the vomit cannon, but boy, did I feel like, I felt like something was over. Just, you know, either inside of me, or the world, or radio, 
or entertainment. It just it it was just one of those things where you're like, you know what they they characterize hitting bottom when you hit bottom where nothing works anymore. Whatever you were doing, whatever you were hooked on, it just doesn't work anymore. And you know what? When you're in a radio station and you're running your morning show and you got a bunch of guys running around in their underwear like it's completely reasonable behavior. You're so insulated in the morning radio area. I know that. because You're, you're the only ones alive in a way, you and your crew. But when you're in there and everyone's like, well, what are we going to do? Uh, there's vomit dripping from the ceiling. That's bottom. You've hit bottom. Do you understand? That That's it. It's time to... It's time to quit something. Reconfigure, man. Okay, I'm going to order food right now, and I'm going to take care of it all online. Okay? That's what I'm going to do. Hold on. Hold on. I'm doing it. Hold on. Hold on. I'm doing it. Okay, I'm going to type in my, uh, I'm at grubhub.com, I'm typing in my address, okay, and what would I like? Uh, I don't know, just find some restaurants. It's searching. Oh my God, I got choices. I got I got the anything button, I got Chinese, I got Thai, I got sushi, I got Mexican, I got Indian food, I got pizza, and I can just order from these places and they'll send them? That is amazing. There are over 40 restaurants that will deliver food to my house when I use Grubhub, and there are dozens in your area as well. All you do is log on, search for what you want, place your order, and get ready to eat without ever picking up the phone. Order online or through the Grubhub app. And Grubhub is free to use, folks. Go to grubhub.com slash WTF and use the code podcast during checkout to get five bucks off your first order over ten dollars. That's grubhub.com slash WTF. Use the code podcast at checkout. Grubhub.com. Yeah, Cosner was great in the movie. He was great. Well, you had a chance to see it. I'm I, happy. I yeah. sat down and watched a movie. I was oh, not wow. like, I mean, I've watched <laughs> most of your movies. We Thank grew God. up with most of the movies, and uh, it. Uh, yeah, I teared up. I thought Cosner did a great job. Thank you. Uh, it's called Draft Day. Draft, Draft Day. Yeah, is that, that's what As it's in called. The right? NFL Draft. You that's know. right. I don't know anything about football. I know nothing. And did it work for you? Yeah, it worked for me because it's a story. It's a human story it, it, about business, about politics, it, it, politics in terms of business. We watch a lot of movies where we don't know. Really, the subject matter. Like, yeah, we don't have to know about how to how to operate a nuclear plant. You know? Yeah, and uh, we get involved in, in in the tension of those kinds of situations. Sure, going to blow up. Oh my God, what are they going to do about it? And they got to do this. Right, but we don't also we also don't watch a nuclear plant every Sunday to see if it's going to blow. <laughs> But uh, yeah, well, that's an interesting. <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe we should. Totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I was it was very compelling, and I thought uh, Cosner did an amazing job playing that character. Like I, I forget what a great actor he is. Yeah, you know, uh, he's not had an opportunity to stretch those muscles. I think in a while. Yeah, and uh, he's done some smaller roles just lately. Uh huh. And here he gets to go full flower. Yeah. Again. And he makes mistakes. I think that's one of the cool things about having a hero that makes mistakes and then sort of takes the whole movie to sort of fight his way out of it, hopefully. I mean, you've been a filmmaker for, what, how long now, 35, 40 years? Yeah, if you include the really early ones, the, the I think the first one was Cannibal Girls. Uh-huh. We made for $12,000. I don't think I saw that one. Yeah. <laughs> Is you that, should. Is it available? I think it is yeah. on videotape somewhere. Uh-huh. But um, I think if you looked online, you could find it. I'm not so sure it's such a good idea. But <laughs> what, um, what, what was Cannibal Girls about? Um, well, it's it's Eugene Levy and Andrea Martin. Yeah. They're the stars long before SCTV right. and, and all the movies that you got yeah, to yeah. love them with. Right. Uh, you know, we were all growing up in Canada and Toronto and... You know, we thought, hey, let's make a movie. I'd done a few shorts. I knew them because we were all hanging around in Toronto. And, you know, let's improvise a feature. Yeah. So from SCTV, that's where we know them from and from the yes, Christopher Guest is, movies. That's right. But this is like... They're kids. Yeah, this is like 15 or years before those movies, I guess. Well, how I mean, old were they? Were they 20? I mean... Yeah. yeah. Something like that. <laughs> okay. Late teens or early 20s, somewhere in that range. And, 
Yeah, we were all in college or just out of college. Right. Yeah, so I think I raised $12,000. Uh-huh. Two for me or actually my father, I think. And um and five other people put in two thousand dollars each. That's yeah. that's how we did it. And it, it was harder to make movies then than it is today, actually, because um, the technology is all here. Or most people have computers. Most people have cameras that shoot really good. Yeah, right. Digital stuff. So, yeah, and it's sync sound. You don't have to have an extra guy to right. do sound. <laughs> right. Um, and there was you had to have a crew. You yeah. had to have a crew. You had to buy thirty-five millimeter film, which is really expensive. And, so, um, you know, we negotiated. But the real problem is that's the movie I found out, oh, yeah, it's good to have a script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though yeah. they're very talented improv people, um, you know, didn't all quite add up when we edited it together. And yeah. Spent the year reshooting and reshooting until it sort of made this weird, goofy <laughs> sense. And when you're shooting improvised footage, I mean, who? Kn- how, how do you know when to stop? When you run out of film? When you run out of budget? I mean... Um, yeah, it, that's it. Sort of the, was the beginning of my training process as a director, just sort of trying to organize that kind of uh, improvisation. And I know that seems like you know it fights that idea, but so it's talking to them, saying cut, you know, having another conversation, doing another take, uh-huh. uh, learning how to do coverage in a situation like that. And it's interesting because now that you know that's fairly common in TV production and and in some movies. I mean, I mean Christopher Guest shoots like that. I don't think a lot of people shoot like that, but certainly there are some television models now that that only do that. Yeah. Like Larry, you know, like uh, yeah, Larry David does that. Yes, and yeah, you know, I think they outline really carefully. They they know where those stories are going, right? And then you know, so they have a premise for each scene. You know, that yeah. adds up into a structure that they've already agreed on, right? And you know they're just really good. So yeah, that's right. That's that, true. That also helps. <laughs> yeah. So Cannibal was the was the first film thing you did. Yeah. I mean, I did a short in college um, called Orientation, which is really a precursor to Animal House. It was about the first couple of days in college of a freshman student. Uh-huh. He, uh You know, and it, it was like a propaganda film for for the clubs at uh, the university. It was turned out to be really funny and uh, actually it showed at a film festival F- uh, somebody from fox canada saw it thought it was great because it got a great response and um they put up the money they blew it up to 35 and it played in movie theaters like for really it was on the head of the i don't know if you remember the movie john and mary it starred mia farrow mary yeah. and uh, uh dustin hoffman I right know. after the graduate it was like a second movie and uh, everyone thought, oh, this is going to be a big hit. Uh, unfortunately for them, orientation got way more laughs. <laughs> was, was John and Mary a comedy? I think so. I have no <laughs> idea what that movie is. Well, look it up. Oh my God! It's like one of those like those are big names, and so it didn't yes. really didn't make the canon of must see movies. No, not that year. But it was great for or my film because it, my film looked so good. I always got applause at the end of it, which was kind of amazing for a little short but yeah it well, was my beginning well was that was that always the plan i mean where you, you grew up entirely in canada well czechoslovakia yeah. until five my parents and i escaped it literally escaped literally bottom of the boat escape tell me what that means bottom of the boat i got some of this information from your son but i'd like to hear it from you I'd, um you know i think they were going to uh, uh you know, it's the communists were running Stalinist communism in 1950. So they pushed the Germans out. Well, I this, mean, they, this is now four years after the Germans are gone, and and and, and it's occupied by basically Russia. Uh huh. Um, and that that's when the Czech Republic and Slovakia were a country called Czechoslovakia. Right. And um, you know, my my father was just a real good capitalist and uh, had built up some business businesses. He was doing vinegar and stuff like that, making vinegar. Uh-huh. Biggest vinegar guy in, in Czechoslovakia. Yeah. He, when the communists came into the country, I mean, they were always there, but when they basically took over the government, which was, I think, in '49, you know, they put my father in charge of all the vinegar factories uh, to supervise them. But he knew it was only a matter of time before he was arrested, like his brother had been arrested, you know, for you know, because he was not a member of the party and. 
and they were planning to leave uh, all this time, and they were secretly converting uh, Czech crowns to American dollars. Your father was, yeah, you know, uh, which was illegal. Yeah, and um, but it was a way to get hard currency to to help us get out. And huh, and sort of one July day, you know, I was called and I was hanging out with my friends, <laughs> and I was I think five. Yeah, and they said oh, I'll, I remember saying to this kid I was playing with, well, I'll see you after dinner. And yeah, uh, next thing I knew, I was putting on like four pairs of pants and shirts, and because it. We could. They figured we couldn't make. Uh, we had to be secretive, and yeah, uh, we took only one suitcase. I kept trying to put my favorite toy was a slide projector. Ironically enough, uh-huh. uh, with um, Disney cartoon characters like Mickey Mouse, uh-huh. Donald Duck on them. Yeah, and I just loved that damn thing. And I just it was a big chunky thing that weighed about five pounds. <laughs> I yeah. kept trying to put it into <laughs> this tiny suitcase and. Um, I actually thought I snuck it in at the end because my mother would just, just keep saying, look, we have to go for a, a long time. We don't have room to take that. And Anyway, to make a very long story short, the um, we stuck ourselves onto a, uh, this boat. I mean, we had made they had made a deal with the captain, uh-huh. paid him some hard currency to, to uh, nail us down in the hold of uh, the boat. To put the floor on top of you. That's right. So because they, those boats were all inspected by the... The communists. Yeah, well, by the Russian soldiers. Sure. There. Yeah. So we got out. We got to Vienna. Um, How long was that? Do you have any I, recollection? I, I don't know. So I think it was overnight. I know I was down there because there was no bathrooms or anything. And right. They had given me a sleeping pill, and they actually given me too much. Yeah. And so when they finally put the candle on to see what was up... Um, I was out cold, but my eyes were open like I was a dead guy. And uh, <laughs> needless to say, I wasn't dead. Yeah. Uh, but it scared the crap out of my parents. Uh huh. Um, we got to Vienna. From Vienna, we got to France where we had an uncle. Um, my um, mother's brothers lived there. We yeah. stayed there for six months until we got a visa to immigrate to Canada where we had another uncle. Wow. And they started from nothing. You know, they didn't uh, speak the language, literally had no money. How did they, we they avoid the Germans? Oh, I, that's an earlier story. But, yeah, they. my mother was in Auschwitz um, and managed to survive that because she was in for the last year, but uh, she was young and strong and got out. And uh, oh my, my father God. was a kind of a freedom fighter guy, and he was running around, you know, killing people. Really? Yeah, and just staying in the woods. And Freedom Fighter, uh, uh, that, I saw a movie about that. It's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, so it's all, uh, it's amazing what we are the products of and how we end up making comedy movies that become famous in America. <laughs> it's a, it's just an interesting See, a journey we go down. Right, so your parent, like, your father has this amazing, you know, determination, clearly. Yeah, they both did. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. my mother was actually the braver one, I yeah. think. It was her idea to escape. Yeah, she was in Auschwitz. And it, what were you told about that as a kid? You know, it wasn't good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they get to where? From Montreal? No, we got to, well, we landed in Halifax. Yeah. And quickly came to Toronto where my um, my uncle and aunt and cousin were. And, uh, you know, we lived with them for a month or two. And then finally we got our own little apartment. My father went to work as a presser. My mother, you know, was very handy um, seamstress mm-hmm. and you know did she did piecework mm-hmm. and it was immediately pregnant with my sister's twins uh-huh and you know that's how they started their life there and what end, what business did he end up uh, going into did he stay a printer or presser or what happened well he ended up buying a dry cleaning store yeah and, and then a couple of them and then he sold those and he eventually bought this car wash property that has now become quite famous because you know, we converted it first to a parking lot after, um, you know, after he worked very hard on it. And it, it's now the home of the Toronto Film Festival, you know, where we built this. Uh, we contributed it, the family did, yeah. uh, to honor our parents uh-huh. you know, to uh, as the home of the of the Bell Lightbox, this lovely sort of film palace in, oh, wow. in the center of yeah. the city. That's beautiful. 
Thank you. Yeah. And, and so was he, was the original, I, so he stayed, he didn't get back in the vinegar, which is probably good. No, he tried to. Yeah. It wouldn't let him in. <laughs> you know, you had to, because the vinegar involves alcohol and things like that. And, um, it's, it was, there was no way to, it was a kind of fixed business in Ontario. It was tough. It was run by the, you know, by, you know, by agencies that you had to know how to yeah. maneuver. And he was just an, immigrant guy who could barely speak english and had no real money so there's no way to get there how did were they able to see your successes yes i'm happy to say yeah they uh you know you know i went to school i put on i had a music group i thought i was i always wanted to be a film composer yeah and so i went into um, i studied music in college and then i started making films and um your orientation was actually the the one i was just talking about was the first film and, you know, they hung in there. They, my father clearly was the guy who said, hey, look, why don't you go into law <laughs> or or something like that, or accountancy or architecture. He was very concerned about yeah. how are you going to make a living in the music business. Uh-huh. And, and, but, you, but that was your dream? The, initially you wanted to be in, uh, you were in a band? Well, I wanted to be in the arts yeah. somehow. I had a, you know, I started in a kind of folk singing group. It was the 60s after all. Uh-huh. And... Um, you know, it was um, the great uh, Chris Guest movie was it a mighty win? A mighty win, yeah. Sort of really brought back memories. Yeah, <laughs> that was my life. <laughs> well, well, Jason said he remembers you uh, playing guitar, and and that he's very moved by it all. And that he he came in here and saw my guitars, and he's like, I have my dad's guitar. <laughs> he so, does. He's really sweet about that. <laughs> it made a big impression on him. Yeah, he never heard my group because my group <laughs> st- stopped playing. <laughs> Long before he was born. Yeah. But um, it was a beginning. And, yeah. you know, we played the local folk clubs on weekends, mm-hmm. you know, in between. This was during high school. And start, and continued to do it into university, but I quickly, you know, got involved in the performance arts. But, there, you know, there were no uh, film classes. Yeah. Uh, they, they were non-existent in, right. the, in the late 60s. Uh, maybe down here they started, but not where I was. We didn't even know what a film director did, right. and uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I just sort of learned by doing. And your 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 father initially he wasn't supportive. Did he become supportive at some point? Yeah, he became very. He knew somehow that um, that I needed a future in the arts. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You know, um, and so he he actually became very supportive. Came to everything I did. Uh huh. And because um, he saw you had a passion for it. I guess, and um, I was also very un- entrepreneurial, uh-huh. and uh, he he kind of got it. He understood the uh, sense of risk. I mean, these are pe- people who risked everything a number of times in their lives, right? And survived and did very well. Yeah. Did he ever Did he ever say anything to you that was uh, you, you you know that that gave you a certain amount of faith? I mean, was there a point where I, I imagine they be initially they're afraid for your future? Well, you know? surely. He, yeah. No, it's. He he was not really happy when I went into music. Yeah, but l- much later, and Jason may have told the story because uh, he he now tells this story much better than I do. I yeah, mean, I think uh, after attending a kind of course in Montreal in 1967, I came home very excited to tell my dad. You know, they got these subway shops, subway sandwiches. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So very right. common right now, but it was a really unique thing, and there weren't any in uh, Toronto. And I said, wouldn't it be great? Like you could put up a little bit of money, I'll I'll run it, and I think we can do really well. And you know, he looked at me kindly, and he said, <laughs> "I'm sure if you wanted to run a Subway sandwich shop, you'd do extraordinarily well, but there's not enough magic in it for you." Right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and I told that story to Jason when he was sort of in pre med uh-huh. uh, at Skidmore, yeah. and uh, it was clearly miserable. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I wasn't even—I didn't even know he was interested in movies. You know? Yeah, yeah. He was on the set of Animal House when he was like thirteen or fourteen days old, and he'd been on all my sets because uh, uh, I tried to make it a point when I was directing, at least, to shoot during the summertime when yeah. the kids were available, and, my, and um, my wife could all—you know—we could just set up camp right. wherever we were. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so he was always around it, and I was always pissed because he didn't seem to pay any attention to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was so much more interested in what everyone else was doing. Right. And um, I actually thought he was just goofing off. And, right. And um, 
He wasn't. He, yeah. he was really paying attention. Yeah, it, it sounded like it to me. Yeah, he's very thoughtful about his process, and I have to assume a lot of that he learned from you, uh, one way or the other. Whether he was paying yes. attention to you or not, <laughs> it certainly had an impact. <laughs> you know, it was remarkable when he first came back to USC after I told him the uh, the magical subway sandwich story, and uh, and told him, look, it's okay if you don't want to be a doctor. Yeah. Um, you know. Going to the arts, you only get to go around once and yeah. and uh, do something that you love. And uh, he decided to quit, and he talked his way into USC. And he, I don't know if he told you the story of his. He initially, as soon as he got back, he raised a, about eight thousand dollars selling advertising to the local uh, kind of shops that are around USC. No, he didn't tell me that. No. Uh, he he had a desk calendar mm-hmm. uh, that he invented that he was going to lay down and on the desks of uh, every freshman incoming student in the uh, yeah in the dorms and uh, so he went to the local dry cleaning store to the pizza place and said look I'm going to be doing this I'm going to distribute 2000 of them and here's the cost for this little square and yeah. you'll be on, you'll be that square on every page and so when they want pizza they're going to call you and he sold it out and yeah. he he profited I mean, he netted out about 8 grand I said, so, Jason, what are you going to do with the egg grant? I was really proud of him yeah. for raising all this money. <laughs> yeah. I said, well, I'm going to I'm gonna direct a movie. I said, you want to direct? <laughs> it was really the first time I realized he was kind of interested in the movies. <laughs> yeah. And, um, uh, you know, it's. I think the, mo- the first movie was Operation, I think. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it's short and then went on to, um, you know, when everything had entered into yeah. it. That's a, that must have been a proud moment for you. Oh, it was extraordinary. I, see, not only the write and direct, and really did a spectacular job of it, um, but he, he had the initiative to actually go raise the money. I think my wife and I, when we, we heard that um, um, that he had raised the 8000 I think we we contributed a few thousand. I said, well, you'll probably need a little bit more, so here's a couple of grand. <laughs> yeah. And um, But he just... Um, you know, he really did it all himself. Uh huh. Do, do you think he had something to prove to you? I think he had something to prove to himself. It's yeah. what you finally have to do. Yeah. When you when you got done with uh, with college and you were you had a music focus and you made the first film. I mean, what what brought you around to directing? What jobs did you do in show business? <laughs> you know that that you uh, had you arrive at what you became. Well, college was a very kind of creative, ex- explosively creative time for me. Where I was a crappy high school student, some somehow by the time I got to college, um, I decided I was just going to do well both in school and and also get involved in the school. And that that for me meant like I got you know I was reviewing it for the newspaper. I I started directing in the dramatic society. These weren't all courses. This was because there were no courses. Right. Arts courses in the school. It was really like clubs. There were clubs, yeah. you know, um, funded by the student society, right? From student fees. So and you're directing plays and I writing did, for I the paper. Plays. I did a musical. I did a full scale version of Little Abner. Directing. Uh, yeah, directing it, and um, and I started. I really liked it, and there was a film club, and because I had done so well on the other clubs, the film club had gone bankrupt, as film clubs tend to do, mm-hmm. and. Um, I sort of convinced the student council to sort of lend me a little bit, you know, to fund it a little bit, and uh-huh. then I would turn it around. Yeah. And I put two clubs together. I I put the film society, which showed films, and the filmmaking club, the board, yeah. the film board together, and and the movie, the money that we received from showing films went to pay for the movies that we made, kind yeah. of a really the Hollywood system, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and just instituted there at McMaster University, and it was very successful. And um, and through that, I made that first film that I spoke about, Orientation. And after college, what did you start doing immediately? I actually started distributing films. I forgot about that. I um, I had met, when I was out trying to sell Cannibal Girls, I met Bob Shea, who ran New Line, New Line Cinema, uh-huh. now a very famous company. Yeah. And um, and I became his Canadian distributor. Really? Yeah, I remember. And we his first the first movie they had was Sympathy Sympathy for the Devil. Jean Luc Godard directed. Sure. 
It's a weird movie. Yeah, the with yeah. the Rolling Stones doing Sympathy for the Devil. It's like intercut with uh, Radicals, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a goofy movie. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> not your not your thing, huh? <laughs> well, it was sort of my thing. Uh-huh. I love the Stones part of it. Yeah, actually, sure, sure. And watching them in a recording studio. Yeah. But I thought Godard generally was pretty pretentious. But the um, I'm going to get letters about that, or you will. Oh, you think so? I hope so. <laughs> if, 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 look, if someone's writing us letters about what you say about Godard, i got a good audience. <laughs> you sure do. <laughs> you, know. you know, it was just, um, we would take it to universities and show it on. Basically, what I was doing in college is what I started doing. We would do these one-night four-wall deals mm-hmm. where we split the take with, with the college, part to us, part back to New New Line yeah. in, in New York. And that was really, it allowed me to have a one-room office yeah. and sort of get going on stuff. And sort of that's from there we did Cannibal Girls, I and, guess. And you did, and you stopped doing live stuff or you did, you know? No, I, uh, Doug Henning, the star, one of the stars of Little Abner and who I went to school with at McMaster, the magician. What was his Broadway show? It was the magic show. The ma- I saw that. Yeah, well, I produced it. I actually started. <laughs> um, I was a kid. Yes. Yeah. I was barely a kid. And um, it, the story of the magic show started as a show called Spellbound. Which, yeah. Again, being entrepreneurial, I I talked to a man named Ed Mervish who, had, who ran the Royal Alexandra Theater, a beautiful theater, legit theater, just down the street from the car wash. Yeah. And... Um, I talked him into giving us two weeks at Christmas time to do this special magic uh-huh. show, and it all yeah. came. I'm I'm telling the story backwards, yeah. but the because um, I had also my only job ever was to work for about six months on a startup cable television network uh, tel- television station called City TV. And yeah, I was doing two shows there every week. One was. Sweet City Women, which was a talk show five days a week. Yeah. Uh, for women. Sweet City Women. Yeah. And yeah. Um, the second show was a show called Greed, which was a 90 <laughs> minute live program on Saturday night starting at 8 o'clock against yeah. the hockey game. Right. Where God knows what we did, but it was a $500 budget and there were sketches. There was, you know, Bikini Girls of the Week. And yeah. there was stu- there was an audience of sort of geriatric. People that we picked up from the local old folks and, home, and you were running the station. I was running that show. Oh, I was okay. the producer director yeah. of that show. Anyway, Doug Henning, who I knew from school, appeared on the talk show. And yeah, I said, and we went out for coffee after. I said, so what do you want to do? Because uh, I knew he was doing like magic all around the place. And he said, well, if I could raise some money to do these big illusions, I'd like to do kind of. I was going to go on tour with a rock group and do these theatrical events with rock music and uh-huh. and magic. And I said, well, that sounds like a, going to be expensive to go from place to place. Why don't we do it as a kind of a theatrical show? Yeah. And he said, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And he just wanted you know somebody <laughs> to raise money for him. Right. And um, I was able to do that. Um, and we started this show. And amazingly... Um, David Cronenberg yeah, the, the wrote the book. I directed and produced. Howard Shore, who be the musical director of the Saturday Night Live SNL, yeah. about five years later, yeah. um, was my composer slash... Uh, These are all Canadian guys. All all living together in Toronto at this moment. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and uh, Paul Schaefer, uh-huh. the, the sure. great pianist, and, yeah. uh, from, he was our band leader really yes and this is the show that went on and then we did this really complex lovely show with magic tricks and stuff and that eventually became the magic show that you saw on broadway that's crazy and so this is schaefer's first gig it's shore's first gig it's uh my first foray into something like i had never done before and we ended up in new york now they all the magic show got totally converted into the show that you saw which was was that frankly a much goofier show than Mm -hmm. what we did I just remember him walking around the stage with his like long hair. And, That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it was the same illusions. Uh-huh. <laughs> really, what 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 stuck was the magic, and, right? And uh, they built this other a book around it with another comp- actually Stephen Schwartz, the famous composer, did Pippin and Godspell, did the music for the magic show. But I got to hang around as the 
they wouldn't let me direct it because I'd uh, not done much. Right. And um, but I produced it, co-produced it, and that was a big hit. Five years. That's on. Un- that's unreal. Yeah. And how did you? How did you meet all these other? You know, like the the guys that are, are usually associated with Second City, and and you know. I knew the Second City guys because we were all growing up. To a lot of them were in Canada, so you right. know Dan Aykroyd, for example, was the announcer on Greed, the show I was just talking Come about. Come on. And uh, <laughs> he's doing it straight, or is it? No, he was part? funny. He yeah. was funny. <laughs> you know he. Uh, we just make up the show in the uh-huh. afternoon, on Saturday afternoon, and there we were at live. Uh, and you guys are what, 20 years old? We're in our sort of mid 20s by uh-huh. now. We're uh-huh. sort of early 20s, somewhere in there. Yeah. And, um, now what happened is I w- had want, having now directed Cannibal Girls, I wanted to do, and I had produced a couple of horror movies as yeah. well in the meantime, uh, for, for David, for David for Cronenberg. Cronenberg. Yeah. Which ones? Uh, Shivers and Rabbit. Oh, yeah, why, those are early. Those are crazy. The yeah. first two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He had, I actually had directed more than he did mm-hmm. uh, by the time he was... But he'd written this wonderful script called Orgy of the Blood Parasites, which was Shivers. Yeah. And um, Did you retitle it? Uh, it? Shivers, yeah, actually, I think it was my title. <laughs> and um, and it was my brilliant idea to bring Marilyn Chambers as the star of Rabbit. and Because um, <laughs> I was living in New York quite a bit. Um and I'd seen her. Uh, there used to be a really funny talk show on Robin Bird, or, or it was something like or the Goldstein show. It was, was it? The, it was the one where they interviewed people in the in and the naked, new, in the right. naked yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I saw her being interviewed, and she's really smart, actually, yeah. and and lovely. Yeah. And I said, why not? Why not her? in uh, as the star of Rabbit, it would make be good for us. We were making it for like a hundred grand, and uh, bring a and different audience in. <laughs> well. It, it would give us notoriety. You right. know, for a hundred thousand sure. dollars, you don't get to a lot of press. Yeah, right, you get right. a lot of press, and it was right. just a kind of a way of um, bringing attention to that project, and it worked. Yeah, and and uh, so you're still friends with Cronenberg, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. Be, uh, I saw him just about a year ago. I don't I don't see him a lot anymore because he lives in Toronto still, uh-huh. and and uh, made his career there. Extraordinary, wonderful career. So how do you get to know, like, you know, from there, how, you, like, because I imagine we're moving towards Animal House, so how'd you get to know Kenny and, and those people? Well, the, um, I cold called the publisher of the National Lampoon. It was always a kind of a favorite magazine of mine. Uh-huh. And it, it, in the sort of mid-70s, when we're talking about it right mm-hmm. now, it was this... It's great. It was the thing, you know, it was, it was the hippest comedy thing around. Uh-huh. And, uh, his name, I look up on the masthead, it's Matty Simmons. I call him up. I said, hey, I've got the show, Magic Show, on Broadway, but what I really want to do is, you know, direct comedies, and let's do a comedy together. And he says, hey, look, we got Hollywood bother- bothering us a lot about making comedy movies, but we're t- talking about doing this sketch show. Do you want to produce it for us? You're really, hey, after all, you've got a Broadway hit. Right. I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. I said, I figured, and the deal I had with, with Matty was, I was going to produce the show. I raised, I think it was, I can't remember, fifteen or twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, and um, not a lot, not a lot. Yeah, but um, uh, I was going to produce the show, and then if for some reason any part of that show became a movie, for sure I would get to produce it with Ma- Maddie. Yeah, with the Lampoon. Right, and perhaps direct it if I could convince the studio, right, or whoever was going to finance the movie, that right, I could direct it. I said okay. And that's the reason I really did it as kind of a first step. And so, um, and that show, this is before Saturday Night Live. And, and before, before Lemmings? Uh, it's the same, it was right after Lemmings. It was okay. the same, right. same period. Yeah. I think it was a year after Lemmings. Right. Um, it's a live show. It's a live sketch show in this, um, in this place that, um, that we did in, Mid- in Midtown. It's in a little theater. Mm-hmm. And it had, here was the cast, and this is before any of these people were known. It was, um, it was Gilda Radner, yeah, and uh, John Belushi, yeah, Bill Murray, Harold Ramis, uh, Br- uh, Brian Murray, Bill's brother, yeah, and Joe Flaherty. Unbelievable! So it's a crazily talented group of people in and, their twenties. Yeah, first time out. Uh-huh. I mean, some of them had worked uh, for the Lampoon and the radio show. Some of them worked as not SCTV, but in Second City in Chicago, right? right. Um, but 
remarkably unknown and remarkably gifted and remarkably arrogant already. And they're just uh, (laughs) because they knew they were the best. And they were the best. It turned out, yeah, they were the best. At uh, at sketch comedy. At at being funny and special Uh uh, in a way that no one had ever seen before. And I remember... I remember the first rehearsal I was in with all of them. and No, I was the producer. I wasn't the director. Belushi was basically directing it. Harold was kind of the calm, the intelligent, calm force uh-huh. that sort of when things went wrong, people would turn to uh-huh. as kind of a, peace, yeah. as a peacemaker. Yeah. And so they're in the middle of working out some sketch, and and they're arguing about something, and I suddenly, I don't know where I say, hey, wouldn't it be good if... And I, I can't even remember what the hell I said. And they just stopped and looked at me like, who's this asshole? <laughs> who's this guy talking to us? <laughs> I said, whoops. <laughs> and uh, Bill Murray, always Bill. You know, it was winter time in New York. And he he walked me over to where all the coats were. Yeah. And he, he took my scarf, which was on top of my coat, and he wrapped it really dangerously around my neck. Uh-huh. And then he put the coat around my my shoulders, and he patted me condescendingly on my back and yeah. said, hey, man, thanks for dropping by. See you later. <laughs> he kicked me out of my show. And uh, that was my sort of first real experience trying to direct this remarkable group of people. And uh, and I said, God, what am I going to do? I'm supposed to be the producer. They don't really have a director. And um, I decided I'd just tough it out and just keep coming back. Did you you built a relationship with them eventually? Yeah, I just had to. I, the wonderful thing that happened is when the show finally got on stage and it was and it was going in front of audiences, they needed someone to talk to. Oh, someone really? from the outside. Right. Someone who wasn't on that stage who could say, you know, I think that sketch is going too long or oh, really? why don't you invert this thing? Just little basic things. Uh-huh. And I just sort of built a friendship with the group. Uh-huh. Uh, Belushi was actually the first one who sort of befe- befriended me, and that uh, finally helped with everybody else. Uh, because B- Belushi, unlike his sort of reputation, was actually very professional. Uh-huh. And um, he was the one who was worried about that we didn't have enough signage right. <laughs> on the street. Yeah. And he would call me up on Sunday and say, look, there's not enough advertising, and uh, <laughs> we're not going to make it. And yeah. uh, you know, the show turned out to be a big hit, uh-huh. and uh, they were all extraordinary in it and did you tour with it um we um we tried it out first in toronto because uh-huh. we were booked into kind of a a bar you know they did the first show and the show, the show went great mm-hmm. and that's the only show we had it was 90 it was about an hour long mm-hmm. and um we thought they were going to clear the bar out and get a whole new group in right. ten, for the 10 o'clock show. Yeah. And lo and behold, it's the same people. It's like, hey, they're drinking. They're not going anywhere. <laughs> and we're, I remember we were sort of yeah. crowded into this little back room. Right. And, and everybody's kind of, the same audience is still over there. I, I remember it was Harold, and I think I wrote about this uh, after uh, Harold passed away because it was such a remarkable thing to remember. Harold said, well, okay, so let's just do it again. Let's just change the punchlines. And we're going. They're going on in like ten minutes, right? <laughs> and, uh, and they all sort of looked, and it was an audacious thing to say, but everybody sort of calmed down and said, "Okay, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Let's just change all the punchlines." <laughs> and uh, it was like one of the greatest shows I had ever seen. That second show, because it w- it was funny in its whole new way, and it was remarkably funny if you had seen the first show and seen the seen the turns on what because they. They not only sort of just changed it and made it funny in itself, it was funny because of what you remembered from the first show. And right, okay. It's like this remarkable, adroit kind of comedy minds at work in panic. Right, <laughs> and, and but so the audience that actually seen it would, would have gotten more out of it than any audience yeah, would so, have. Right. So the ones who were not drunk, because there's, some of them were so drunk, they said, hey, man, we just saw this. Right. Um, and didn't actually hear the changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The people who were paying attention, which was most of the audience, just it, it was like one of those great events. And this is, you know, this is before, just at the beginning of the VCR era. So it was never recorded. It was never taped. And it's too bad because it was just the two shows together would have been a remarkable lesson in how to create comedy. And it was for you. And it certainly was for me. And and the memory of it is crisp. Yeah. And it's ama- like it's a big memory. Like yeah. that was an amazing thing to witness. Yeah. 
Now, as you move forward with this stuff, because it seems to me just talking to you that you're always very adept and, and on top of the idea of, uh, that that film was a, a business. Now, you're an entrepreneur and making movies is a business. It's, it's not, you know, the, the, the art form of making movies is what it is, but, you, you know, you always wanted to make con- commercial movies. Well, particularly back then, there was no way to be, there was no way to be making films unless you had some kind of at least minor business understanding you knew it was going to cost a lot of money right even if it was a million dollars that's a ton of money right and uh and that was extraordinarily cheap so uh, you had to sort of find a way to convince people that it was worth it to make the investment well even if it wasn't a studio so now when you when you got adam how how did your involvement how did the animal house evolve um that was the first big movie right that was that in the what yeah, 70 what was it? 79 or so. Okay. Think, Be- yeah. Right before Meatballs. Yeah, what happened with Animal House, just if you remember my deal with Maddie Simmons. Right. So Lauren Michaels, also a fellow Canadian, sort of sh- shows up to the show and basically hires most of the cast. He hires Gilda. And, Your show. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and he found many, many other wonderful people after as well. And, um, so, and Bill, Bill Murray doesn't get on Saturday Night Live right away. He gets on another show with his brother. Also called Saturday Night, yeah, and with Howard Cosell, and so the only person who didn't have a job uh, was Harold. Uh-huh. And um, I said, "Look, let's go write a movie based on this show because I knew that's the way that I get to be involved in some future National Lampoon film project." Right. And so the conversion of that show first became, believe it or not, Charlie Manson in high school. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> what? and because it was high school, it involved Doug Kenny, uh-huh. uh, who had written the high school yearbook. That was a great parody. It was one of the great yeah. parodies that the last uh, Lampoon ever put out. Yeah, and where I started my friendship with him, and mm-hmm. and then it became clear this was a extraordinarily hard R raunchy comedy, and we probably shouldn't set it in high school; that we should set it in college, and. That's when Chris Miller became part of the writing team because he had written these wonderful stories, but mostly about his his life at Dartmouth, uh, uh, where the main character Pinto, mm-hmm. uh, uh, which is really him, yeah, um, and his ad- and his adventures in mostly the frat house in, uh-huh. in the Delta House, uh-huh. and so you know, now we have Harold and Doug uh, Kenny and Chris Miller and. And really, the result of that was Animal House. Wow! Which I wanted to direct, and I wasn't a lot. You know, studio was universal; they hated the scripts, and uh, they finally got convinced to do it after a very long two-year gestation. Yeah. And uh, I said, "Please, I'd like to direct." I've been working on this for two years. I got John Belushi here, who yeah. was becoming famous as a result of his first year on Saturday Night Live, and uh, they said, "Nah," <laughs> because the only movie I'd done. Cannibal Girls was not that impressive to them. <laughs> and uh, well, what had Landis done? Um, Landis had done uh, he done Schlock, which was no better than uh, Cannibal Girls. But yeah. but but just before Animal House, he had done uh, the really the movie with the Zucker Brothers, um, Kentucky Fried Movie. Oh right, which actually was quite a big hit with Belzer and a bunch of other guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so the um, uh, you know we we checked him out, and he. Uh, we hired him, and he, he turned out to be great. He did a great job. You like him? Yeah, I like him. I think he had wonderful energy. You know, his his tone is different than mine. Yeah. And uh, had I been so fortunate to direct it, um, probably it would have been a different movie. It would have it wouldn't have. I don't think it would have been as hard edged as as and as physical uh-huh. as Animal House became. Uh huh. And I think. Animal House was better for it, you right? Know, so, a little, a little, I, a little yeah, raw, more raw. And I think the combination of the two of us together on that was, uh, and of course, the, the brilliance of the writing, yeah, because uh, it was really one of the great scripts that sort of created a new comedy language. Sure, it can uh, change the game. Yeah, it changed the game. You know what? It was the first time the baby boomers were sort of speaking their own words, their right. own comedy words. Right. It had already started. Uh, before that film, but in serious movies, it was movies like Easy Rider mm-hmm. and um, you know Bonnie and Clyde all had sort of were kind of a fresh view on what 
how movies would work. Right. But it was the first time somebody was... MASH was kind of a stepping stone movie a few years before. And right. And then, boom, there was something. And Paul Mazursky was doing stuff, but he really was war generation, not post-war generation. Right, right, right. And Animal House... Uh, weirdly, even though it was kind of a college picture set in 1962, written in 1978, 77, um, just sort of hit the button. The baby boom generation were all just postgraduate. And so th- it resonated in a whole new way. It resonated with kids my age. I mean, you know, 13, it's, 14, 15 years old, all the way through college. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, wonderfully, it's continued to resonate. You know, people still put it up as one of the great comedies and and still appreciate it and it was an extraordinary beginning for me and and and, and it set you moving towards i mean i i think stripes which you all you directed and did you, you produce that as well yeah that changed the game too i mean those were like that was a you know a, well then became i had a really hot run after that meatballs too yeah well meatballs was i saw oh god i you know the studio was paying no attention to me once it became clear that animal house was going to be a a hit, even though I'd worked on the movie and sort of really yeah. a fought for it to get made and had a lot to do with the the writing of the script, they, you know, everybody else sort of got deals. And um, I said, God, I better start directing. And I called my friends up from Toronto, who I'd gone to school with back yeah. at McMaster, and I said, let's do a summer camp movie. And we literally, this was in March, and we wrote in a couple of months, and we were shooting in July, or end of July. We started shooting a week before Animal House came out, and um, that's how fast it was the turn turned around. around. Yeah, I called up Bill, who I knew from my show. He is yet to be on Saturday Night Live. He was he was going to be the new kid coming on. I think right. he had done one or two performances right, for Lauren be- during the year that very yeah. first year, and then he was coming on as a full time player. The and a genius, year. comedy genius. Yeah, very well, very unique. Yeah, but. Bill was busy, you know, golfing and playing softball, and he said, "Look, I no thank you." And I said, "Please, you gotta, you gotta help me on this." And he he refused to agree until the day before I started shooting, and I refused to hire anybody else. And uh, I think he took pity on me. <laughs> and I think really, he, I don't know, but he finally agreed. And um, it was a big movie for him. It was it it was his first big movie. It turned out to be. A, a real wonderful hit. And yeah, as I was probably the most important movie for me because I was it was really the first real movie I directed, and it sort of defined his early comedic persona. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, that lasted for years. Yeah, well, the combination of I think the movies that I directed, yeah. uh, Meatballs, Stripes, and the two Ghostbusters, mm-hmm. really kind of were part of it. And then Harold's the movies that Harold directed, you know, Groundhog Caddy, Day, Groundhog Day, Caddyshack. You know, there were that combination really set his comedic persona. And, yeah. Um, is we, we're all really fortunate to have gotten to work with him. Yeah, Ghost. It's amazing to me that you know the Animal House stripes, Ghostbusters. I mean, that defined and Groundhog Day. You and Harold yeah. defined what what modern film comedy was for years. Thank you. <laughs> Do you feel? And that? I'm sure Harold thanks you as well. Uh, it's sad, <coughs> sad that he's gone, huh? Yeah. So did, now, how did you not end up uh, producing with him? I, it was uh, he was just running his own thing over there? Or? Well, look, I, you know, it's I can understand it. I, it's because uh, I was producing and directing those movies that he was co-writing, uh-huh. and I think he it was he wanted to direct, and it was time for him to go out on his own, right? And uh, sort of build his own reputation. And uh, so I think Caddyshack, he was in. I think he wrote Vacation first, actually, and that was the. First, and I had nothing to do with that, and so he got on to sort of his own world with that film. That's another extraordinary movie directed. In, in and when you see yourself in your evolution as a filmmaker, I mean, obviously you're you're an amazing producer, and you, you do both. It looks like you produce more than you direct in in the overall picture, right? Yes. So I, I see on here that that heavy metal was your production, and I remember seeing that when I was a kid, probably inappropriately. Yeah. And it was, uh, yeah. <laughs> and it was, uh, you know, because it was eighty one. I, well, I wasn't that young. I was, it was, I was graduating from high school, so that was about right. But I mean, to to like, well, I remember that movie came out, the whole Ralph Bakshi thing, and and then you know all those uh, animators. I mean, how did you get involved with something like that? It seems like uh, off the grid a little. Well, uh, actually, the National Lampoon magazine also published Heavy, Heavy Metal. metal. Oh, so right. one of the publishers called me and said, 
because I had done well with the lampoon because of Animal House. They said, "Well, would you like? Would you be interested in this?" Mm-hmm. And I was. I was a fan of the magazine. I was a fan of the illustrations. Yeah, that was fa- that was amazing stuff. Yeah, and- it was fun. And you know, I I basically directed that movie, even though I called myself that we had an animation director, but really I did all the. I did all the good enough voices. I got Candy in there as kind of the voice of Ben, and candy. I, it's just a wonderful uh, time. Hey, yeah, those guys were so good. It was such a generation of amazing comedians. It really was. So, as your evolution as a filmmaker, when did you like? Because I, I can see like the you, you continued doing comedies, but then like something started to change a little bit. I mean, something got you got uh, attracted to a different type of comedy eventually. Well, you know, you grow older and and you shift and you try yeah. to do different things. So, an early one for me was Legal Eagles with Robert Redford just after he'd won an Academy Award, mm-hmm. you know, for Ordinary People, and that was a handful. Yeah, uh, to direct and we had like three quarters of a wonderful script and it's three quarters of a wonderful movie. Right. And uh, <laughs> it was just really interesting to work with him and Deborah Winger and Daryl Hannah right. as the stars of that film and. Um, you know that was right after Ghostbusters, an odd thing to sort of do, and it was, it was kind of cool. And and did you see it, like did you feel yourself changing in terms of like you know moving away from from shtick or, or from you know young people's movies necessarily? No, you no. Just, I mean, because uh, right after that I did Twins, right? Which I certainly worked for young young people as well as, you know, yeah. it was a kind of a, it was one of those silly ideas that sort of occurred, uh, because I you know I met Arnold. I, just after I did Ghostbusters, I saw yeah. him up in Aspen. He was skiing with his family, as I was. And right. He said, oh, you're the Ghostbusters guy. And I said, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and said, I could be a Ghostbuster. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I took him for, at his word. Yeah. <laughs> and I and Danny and I, DeVito, uh, go way back when I was producing in Canada. And he was supposed to star or co-star in a in a film that I was producing, a kind of big-time action movie Uh with Don Stroud and uh, Brenda Vaccaro. Yeah. And um, he actually came up, and it was about the time he was doing uh, the great Michael Douglas produced film. uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And uh, uh, we couldn't get him into the country. I mean, we got him in the country, but he wasn't allowed to work. And so I had to turn him away. And we became friends after that. He had a good sense of humor about it, fortunately. And, um, you know, I saw him at one of these Disney cartoon events um, with his family and my young family. And mm-hmm. and we, he said, let's do a film now together. And, and it was just about the time I saw Schwarzenegger, and I sort of... That was it, huh? Well, I started thinking about it, and I, I pitched an idea to... Uh, uh, a couple of writers. Yeah, I said let's let's make them brothers. Yeah, and I think I was the one who said twins. Yeah, <laughs> and um, and it went from there. When you look at it, because I talked to your son about this as well. I mean, because he did Dave, which I thought was a great movie. Thank and you. That, that was very well received, wasn't yes, it? Yes, very well received. And and the it, when you look at a script that you don't write, it, you, you know what is appealing to you? What what makes you decide to well, do I, it? Well. I, it's like what happened on draft day. It's um, where I see characters that I sort of can get my head into, and where there's an, a both conflict and emotionality, mm-hmm. and it doesn't necessarily have to be funny at all. And, right. I mean, draft day wasn't particularly funny as a, when I read the screenplay, and um, certainly Dave was. Yeah. And, but I did a lot of work with uh, Gary Ross, who wrote a wonderful, f- you know, f- initial draft, and then we worked together for about. Six months. And the same thing happened here on draft day. So I get myself very involved in the in the development of the script. But those are the two that I didn't get into right from the beginning. They there were these wonderful gifts that came to me uh, over the transom. And with with something like uh, with with draft day, I mean, you 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 used a lot of great character actors surrounding uh, Cosner. Well, I, I, I felt, you know, this has got to feel real. Yeah. you got to feel like these guys belong in these rooms, that they know football. Right. That they're, they have that call. There's a voice. It's a sound of a voice. Right. I, I think it's partially the musical background that I have. I actually listened to the timbre 
of how they speak. It's not even how good an actor they are, although that's certainly very important. Right. But it's just the sound, the actual sound. It's what's remarkable about Costner. Costner is like Gary Cooper, you know. He's yeah. just, he's got this all-American thing about him, and it's the way he delivers the lines, the actual sound of it. I remember the, I remember one of the first times I was sitting around with him, I suddenly stopped and I said, God, you're so American. Yeah. <laughs> You, yeah. you represent really what we think of as the best. There's something really grounded and real and trustworthy uh, and a kind of quiet dignity about him that um, um, has made all the roles that he's played, you know, really sing. Yeah. And I thought that quality is what this guy has to be, is a guy who's under amazing pressure, uh, for makes mistakes, and... But still is the kind of guy that, you know, men want to follow and women want to right. sleep with. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, the, the compressed kind of character that he played. That to me is yes. the most challenging thing to see an actor do to hold back, you know, because like he's got to hold back and, and play his cards close to his chest through the whole movie. And the relief of that at the end is, is pretty phenomenal. Yeah. And it's, but it's also what real life is like. You know, yeah. I, most people don't get up and scream and pontificate, and they're boring to watch anyway. Right. Um, and to be with. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's it's the quiet strength uh -huh. that uh, we admire. Right. And now, when you work with actors, I mean, do you have a method that you do, or do you do you just trust them? I mean, how do you direct? I I I get involved. Yeah. You know, I think um, I've learned. You know, I've. I've learned to sort of speak to actors. It's um, it's a process. It's different than blocking. I've never sort of focused on. It's probably because I didn't go to film school, right? Uh, I think my films are actually visually elaborate, more elaborate than most comedy filmmakers have been. And I think Ghostbusters are very elaborate, yeahly designed film, yeah. Um, and Draft Day is for a film that is really about people in rooms on telephones. Is a very visually exciting film. But you used an interesting device as some sort of sweep, and you know there's a, it was almost like a take on the '70s stuff, the compartmentalizing of the screen. Well, because it's got, I had to create some kind of split screen technique because there's a lot of phone calls, and just a standard split screen where people are on two edges. Yeah, seemed like it would get very dull very quickly, and yeah. So um, I just developed some new ideas. Using di digital technology, I could take people out of their backgrounds and right. I could violate that line yeah. that we understand. Oh, that's that place and that's that place. Right. This other place. And yeah, they had some people sort of floating until they kind of came into place. Well, their elbows would go and then suddenly their right. whole bodies were in this other room uh, where the other guy was. And it's it's really what telephone calls. If you think of what a telephone call is, uh -huh. you know, your eye, whether your eyes are open or closed and you're speaking, you know, your ear is just taking all this information, and it's as if you're in the place with this other person. Uh -huh. And so for you, uh, the phone call is quite intimate. Right. Um, if you're watching two people talk on a phone, it's just a kind of a dull thing. And <laughs> yeah. So I was trying to recreate that sort of sense of seeing these people be together in an environment, in a single environment. Well, and you, make that work even though they were in two places. Well, yeah, well, you put it that way. It was very effective because, like, you know, now having just seen it two hours ago, and it's in my mind that you did get the feel that they were engaged. Yeah, and and we quickly learned that we could do things that, you know, we could invent our own stuff, which is yeah. a whole scene it didn't have to be all that. We could just cut it in a traditional way and then suddenly go to that where it was where it was most effective. That I one guy could be on a wide shot and the other guy be, could be in a close up. Right. We could sweep the screens across and and now suddenly be. In a different piece of coverage, I could edit within one half of the scene and not edit on the other side. And the most interesting thing for me was also when the scene was over, I could stay with both of them, uh -huh. even though they weren't talking to each other anymore. And because it allows the viewer to watch two responses to the same conversation in their private moment. And because this is all about, you know, the negotiations and what people are thinking and what are uh, and how people get affected emotionally through those kinds of things. That it it gave us a lot of internal emotional um, 
experience and knowledge by doing things like that. But by a, by being by, able to stay on the beats after. Yes. Which is interesting because it's a there's a pivotal point in the movie where they have to watch footage yes. to assess something that you know was suggested that they overlooked. That's the right. The beat after the play. Yes. Ah, oh, so uh, so there, there, you know, the, the thought processes around creativity as director has got to be <laughs> got to be running on a lot of levels. Yeah, I mean, and um, part of it is just instinctive, you know. That, uh, yeah, like, I mean, we figured this out as we were doing it, and uh, I had a sort of very early take on on it do- done by these brilliant designers, and I said, "Wow, there's just so much opportunity in it," and and it really encouraged me to shoot in a certain kind of way. Right, and do, are you a football fan? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a, one of those t- statistical guys who knows every player and what, yeah. how they did. And yeah. I, I mean, I basically know the rules, yeah. and um, I follow the teams, and I bet on the games on Sundays. I have a group of guys. We hang out together on Sunday mornings up in Santa Barbara, and yeah. they've been doing it for about 25, 26 years. I've been involved for about 18 years uh-huh. with them, and it's, and it's a remarkable group of very uh, sort of... Um, successful men from all walks of life it, it, it it's pro, it's amazing to me because i don't watch sports at all it's not part of my life at all and i and i was completely engaged in the movie and I, I love to hear that and i got <laughs> and i got choked and up. i hope your audience will hear it as well well you know i'm i'm also a guy like i like you know as whatever i claim to be well it's not a matter of whatever i claim to be i mean i like uh, you know, arty things, but I also like, you know, I, you know, I, I cried at the right places, there, you know, and I, right. and, I, and there was moments where I wanted to, you know, ask you, where do, are you aware of of where, you know, like, all right, this is where we're going to get the tears? No, that, um, not that way. I'm aware that certain scenes have an emotional impact, and I go for them. I mean, I, um, I'm sort of uh, an old fashioned guy in yeah. terms of, I think. Um, I believe in a certain kind of structure and in the storytelling, mm-hmm. uh, but I shake it up and I, um, and I, you know, I'm optimistic about you know about humankind. Yeah, I think it's it's come from from what my background is with my uh, and with my parents, and so my my stories tend to be uplifting, even what, if they're raunchy or goofy or yeah. silly. Right. Um, there's a kind of certain structure that I've, I mean, I didn't even notice it. Um, I wasn't conscious of it, but I suddenly, as I started to evaluate what I've done over these years, yeah, uh, you know, you you become more aware. Of, oh, yeah, you're sort of doing that, yeah. and uh, um, and I just try to focus the moments. I right. think a good director needs to focus his yeah. moments and build them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I talked to your son about it, and he he, you know, emotionally does not play in the same ballpark that you not do. at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> but he's compelled by by like you, you know when you talk to him as I'm sure you have, you know he says he he'll find a moment that resonates the sort of you know grotesque but beautiful nature of of, of human beings and and celebrate those things and right. challenge himself to to shed light in the darkness of of characters that are that are that are hobbled yes uh, and and celebrate them. And you know, but clearly his his you know love of narrative it has to come from you in some way. Do you think? I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. But no, I mean, but I think a movie like Young Adult, um, uh, which I think is just like this really brilliant movie that he did, and I mean it's it, yeah, it's, it's great. just looking into this broken alcoholic a woman, brilliantly played by Charlize Theron, and um, you know he wrote that and he just. I think he just did a. It, it's such a special film. It, yeah. It's not a film that I could do. Yeah. You know, I mean, I I could get the performance. Yeah. But it, it's really not in my DNA, and it's not who I became um, as a result of the way, you know, I grew up and and the struggle that I had to go through, which was a totally different struggle than he had to. He had to sort of overcome a kind of, you know, a successful dad and uh, and living in. And with success in his life, and not becoming a fucked up kid, you know. Yeah. And he's uh, he's just a great guy. All the all our children, knock wood, have turned out good. Yeah. <laughs> you did something right. I think it was mom. Oh yeah. <laughs> we did something right. <laughs> but you did produce up in the air for your son. Yes. And it was the first time, and actually the only time we technically worked together. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And it was a 
a really good experience for both of us, I think. Uh huh. I don't know what he said, but. No, no, of course. He, well, he, I, I think that the interesting thing about him, and, and it was completely coincidental that I talked to him, is that there, there's a, an amazing amount of respect and uh, for you, but also he hears everything you say. Yes. And, 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 you know, and he, he has absolute appreciation and respect for your wisdom in producing and directing. And he's going to filter that through. Like, it's not, none of it's lost on him. Yes, no, but it has <laughs> to go through his instrument. Right. My, f- I, I think the most uh, critical moment in our relationship, uh, both as producer director on that film and the, really as father son, uh-huh. came in the middle of that movie or it, during the editing process, where I was being a little critical of him and I was sort of fighting too hard. And he suddenly stopped and he said, "You're being too rough on me. You're not treating me with enough respect." And I looked at him and I'm like, "What?" <laughs> I talk like this to all the guys. <laughs> and said, no, um, you know, other producers I've worked with have treated me with more respect. Oh and it God. broke my heart. And um, <laughs> and I suddenly, but I stopped and I yeah. really paid attention. And I realized, oh, I'm talking, you know, I'm talking presumptuously like his dad. Right. And that's not the relationship here. He's this extraordinary director that you're lucky enough to produce. Yeah. And, you know, he's written this brilliant movie. Yeah. We're in the middle of it, and you should pay more attention <laughs> and treat him. And I probably wouldn't speak to other, to directors of his caliber, the way the way I was. And it, it was like this two-hour conversation we had in the middle of a day, where we ended up both crying. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me emotional just thinking about it right now. And um, and it was a big turning point. And um, uh, we both actually started listening in a different way. Um, I think he shifted as well uh-huh. as a result of the conversation. And and I found that since then, and our relationship was always good. It's not, I mean, we've had our normal strain moments, um, you know, when he was a younger guy and, you know, when you're going through high school and the stuff that you get into. But well, I yeah, think, He talked about that dating that woman for years. And yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to explain that. Uh, but I, you know, but this was... Kind of this lovely um, adult moment between mm-hmm. us that you know just has helped us. And it was a it was a two hour conversation. Uh, yeah, about- at least I remember being out in the parking lot and and both of us bawling and sort of speaking in a you know just in a very direct, honest way to each other. Uh huh. And 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 there was no uh, shouting. No. No, quite the opposite. Right. Was, right. I think we both wanted to hear each other right. and to understand each other. And I think there was a remarkable understanding, actually, finally. Yeah. Uh, but it had to get out in the open. And he was brave enough, you know, to confront me at that moment. And and I guess I was brave enough to sort of admit when I was wrong. Wow. Yeah. And and do you, could you see yourself working together again now? Oh, I'd love it. And we do in a in a kind of unofficial capacity. I think... You know, much like the relationship with Harold Ramis back at the beginning and after those movies where he had, I think he felt that he had to at least initially build his brand mm-hmm. and build his own legacy and his own, um, you know, his, um, most importantly, his, his own identity. And that um, was such an important part of it. Um, it was important for him to realize there was no nepotism involved in his life, that he fought for everything. Right. And he really did. I mean, when I think of the things that I did for him, yes, I got to produce up in the air, but that was a gift to me. Yeah. Uh, I think he had talked to me two years prior. I think it was about the time he did Thank You for Smoking. Mm-hmm. He, he said, you know, I've, he, always, he always was encouraging me to do sort of more serious work because he, yeah. he felt that I could do it. And he was very happy when I did Dave. Uh, Dave and yeah. he was extraordinarily happy when I found Draft Day. He loved that script and thought it would be a great thing for me to do at this time and uh, but prior to that just uh, before he started juno he had found this book up in the air and he said you should direct this should go turn this into a movie and go buy it and so i did yeah um i read it and i didn't really understand it um or the way the book was which is quite different than what the movie is and you know hired a bunch of really fancy uh, writers yeah none of them could who could get it at all and we went through two or three drafts spent quite a lot of money and could never get it right 
And I remember at the Toronto Film Festival, right after Juno had uh, premiered, I I knew he was ready for something else, and I I saw him uh, for dinner after the premiere, and uh, I said, I think you should do Up in the Air. You clearly love it. You get it. I don't get it. Um, I mean, I get it. I think I get it in terms of where you want to, what you want to do with it, but I have not been able to find someone who can write it. So why don't you give give it a shot? And uh, he thought about it for about a week, and he said, "Okay, I'm going to give it a try." And he, like he, he wrote a draft in like 40 days. And it was so much better than anything I'd we'd <laughs> slaved over for a couple of years, and um, and it was just brilliant. I said, "We got to do this," and we. We showed it to the studio. They got it right away, and, you know, we made the film. That's an amazing story. It's got me choked up. <laughs> it really is. And, and it, it, you know, just to, to hear, you know, that the mutual respect that, you know, that, that he gave to you when I talked to him and it going back like that, it, it's, it's, it, it, I can't imagine the, the, the pride and depth of, of the relationship. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It doesn't happen too often. No, I guess not. Yeah. So you look forward to working with him again if you can. Yes, I'd like to work with uh, my daughter Catherine is like this brilliant actress, comedian, um, who's just on the cusp of being sort of getting that right part that where people can see it. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, she's gotten close a bunch of times. And uh, uh, I would love to be that director, but I'm worried that it'll sort of, you know, that whole nepotism, it'll be too weird. It'll be, it'll, actually, it'll it won't be, not help her. It'll put a stink on it. Yeah, yeah. so... So you got to wait it out. Got to wait it out. I think, but she's got the stuff. That's great. And do you think that you did uh, draft day because of Jason's encouragement? Do you think that he gave you confidence in that? No, I, I mean that just was good news. You know, that he was think, into it. Yeah, that uh, that was kind of like um, uh, just helped me more, be more confident about the choice. But I think I had um, I read the script in the middle of the night, mm-hmm. and it was just like something I got from my agent, which never happens. Yeah. I mean, I get scripts, but never something that I couldn't put down. Right. And uh, I read it in about an hour, and I knew by the time I, I finished reading it that I wanted to make it. I wanted to direct it. Uh-huh. And the writers, happen to, they're, they live out of town, but they happen to be in the city, and I met with them two days later. And first words out of my mouth is, look, I don't know how, but somehow I want to direct this. I'm going to make it. And... Um, I got actually Paramount at the time, um, bought it on my behalf, uh-huh. and we worked on it a little bit, and then finally we got the script where I wanted to shoot it, which was about three or four months later, and got Costner to want to do it, and Paramount, in their wisdom, decided to put it in a turnaround, and uh, uh, fortunately Lionsgate you know, fell in love with it as well, and, and, and we yeah. just made it. And you got great supporting cast, you got Leary in there, and you got... Um... Yeah, Dennis Leary, wow, what yeah. a talent. Yeah, he produced uh, my show, my TV show, him and Jim. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, but he's he, 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 when he's cast right, it's like it's spectacular. You know what I mean? It's just like that was just it's like a nice big meaty meal for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, he and there's something you know. Speaking of music, yeah, <laughs> you know, there's the something that in the musical rhythms between the way he talks and the way Costner talks. Yeah. They just make those scenes delicious. Yeah, yeah, they're really great. It was an honor talking to you. And so I, much fun. And I'm glad that uh, I'm glad I got to meet father and son in two days. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, he had a good time. I know he called me up this afternoon and said, "Hey, I hear you're doing. <laughs> I just did it. Yeah. Oh yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's beautiful. Thank you, Mr. Reitman. Thank you. Okay, folks, that's it. That's our show. Go to WTFPod.com for all your WTF Pod needs. I will be in Raleigh, North Carolina. Good nights tomorrow night, Friday the uh, 18th, and Saturday the 19th. I will be at the Trippany House at the Steve Allen Theater, uh, April 22nd and 29th. Those are Tuesdays. You can get my book, Attempting Normal, at booksellers everywhere. And now, hang out, all right, because i got to set up the Vomit Cannon, which is great radio. Boomer lives!
Hey, are you hungry right now? Then order some food using Grubhub. Grubhub is the best way to connect hungry diners with their favorite local restaurants. Search, order, and eat without ever picking up the phone. Order online or through the Grubhub app. And best of all, it's free to use. Go to Grubhub.com slash WTF and use the code PODCAST during checkout to get 5 bucks off your first order over $10. That's Grubhub.com slash WTF. Use the code PODCAST to check out. We're also sponsored today by LegalZoom. If you're starting a business, forming an LLC, or getting a will, LegalZoom will provide the personal attention you need and help take care of the details. LegalZoom is not a law firm, but provides self-help services at your specific direction. Visit LegalZoom.com and enter the discount code WTF for more savings. That's LegalZoom.com. All right, let's do the show. All right, let's do this. How are you? What the fuckers? What the fuck buddies? What the fuck nears? What the fuck nicks? What the fucksters? What the fucksables? I'm recording this on the eve of my colonoscopy. That's the way this is going to go. I haven't eaten all day. I drank one bottle of this stuff. I think I'm, I'm empty. I'm clear. There's nothing going on in me. Zero. Feels great. I'm purged. I'm lethargic. I, I can still, I got the energy, man. I can still give it to you. This is Mark Marin, if you're wondering. Today is Ivan Reitman Day on WTF. We had Jason Reitman on, on, uh, Monday show, and now his father, Ivan Reitman, who has made some great comedies over the years and has a, a film called Draft Day with Kevin Costner, which I saw, and I don't know anything about football, and I got, I got choked up, got choked up and jerked around and excited. That's a, you know, that's what it's supposed to do. Cosner was pretty fucking great. I'll tell you that right now. And, uh, you know, he, he's not always great, but he was good in this movie. Why am I talking up the movie? Because I saw the movie. I'm going to talk to Ivan Reitman, but I'm going to talk to him about Animal House. I'm going to talk to him about Meatballs and Stripes and, and Dave and Ghostbusters and, you know, where all that, it's all going to happen. We're going to talk about his son. It was interesting talking to his son, Jason, and, you know, getting a heads up on a couple of things and getting Ivan's angle on it. This is real showbiz, folks. These are real showbiz people. This is big time showbiz, Ivan Reitman. He's a big time movie director. He changed the course of modern movie comedies. What else do I want to tell you before I get into stuff? Uh, my book in paperback, Attempting Normal, available wherever you buy books. I will be in Raleigh, North Carolina tomorrow night. The 18th and 19th, I will be in Raleigh at Good Nights. Come down. I'm also going to do a couple more shows at the Trippany House at the Steve Allen Theater. That's uh, Tuesday the 22nd. And Tuesday the 29th, I threw those on there to uh, to have some more fun. It was thrilling to have uh, Ivan Reitman in here. He's a he's a huge director, and a lot of times I've had a lot of big people on the show, but I don't get to talk to a lot of directors. And talking to Jason and Ivan Reitman was uh, was special for me uh, in the sense that uh, this is it's big time showbiz. Why am I hitting that? Why am I hammering it? Why am I telling you that twice? Because I was in Cleveland uh, last weekend, and I had an experience that uh, I, I'm not sure what it signified. I, I'm not quite clear on it. It definitely had a profound meaning to me, and it seemed to be a signifier for everything wrong in show business and entertainment, or perhaps everything that was that is wrong in the world. It was some sort of hitting bottom. It, it, it's, it seemed I witnessed show business Hitting bottom. Let me explain to you. Look, I've done a lot of uh, a lot of radio in my life. I've, I've hosted a radio show. I'm by no means a radio veteran, but as a comic, I've done a lot of morning radio with morning radio people. I've been in some awkward situations. I've been in some, you never know what's going to happen on a morning radio show. I've been in some awkward porn situations. I've been in some awkward, slightly racist situations. I've been in some awkward contest situations. I've had awkward conversations, but that is sort of part and parcel for morning radio. Now, shocking stuff is shocking stuff, and uh, you know sometimes it's done well, sometimes it's just uh, stupid, and sometimes it's utterly pointless, but I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm 50 years old that when I got to the radio station in Cleveland, I'm not even going to mention show, the show, it doesn't matter. Something was going on. You know, we're waiting in a hallway to go into a radio studio, and out of a studio, uh, a, a short man uh, in his underwear comes running out and running down the hall. He needs a bucket or something. So now I know, like, all right, something 
is going on. And I'm a little irate because there's part of me that thinks like, what, what am I walking into? Yeah, it's not even that they're trying to sandbag me. It's just they're, they're, they're trying to sandbag everything I represent as a functioning human being by whatever the fuck is going on in that room. So I didn't get too freaked out. I'm like, all right, I'll play along. But then, uh, a producer or someone involved with the show comes up and, uh, walks us into a room to show us the, the, uh, the live cam of the studio, which is completely covered in plastic tarp. So something, something big is going to go on. These guys have been planning something. They're up to something. It's going to be spectacular, right? So then the guy pulls me out and he starts talking to me about what's going to happen. He says, well, we've got a vomit cannon. You're going to, you're going after the vomit cannon, but I think it's going to be all right. And I'm like, I'm not going in there after a fucking vomit cannon. I didn't say that, but I'm like, really? What is a vomit cannon? Apparently these guys have put a couple of days work into reconfiguring a leaf blower uh, and hooking a funnel up to it so one guy could drink a bunch of milk and vomit into the funnel as it sprays all over the the guy in his underwear and in his mouth and stuff. I know what you're thinking, folks. You're probably thinking like, man, that sounds amazing. Did that go well? No, it didn't go well. And no, it doesn't sound amazing. First of all, it's like that jackass stuff has been jackass. And they can do it because they got a sort of punk rock spirit to it. There's some creativity to it. This was utterly fucking pointless. And it was just one of those moments where I'm like, well, this is show business. This is this realm, this level, which is the bottom of show business. I'd hit the bottom of show business that day. Look, if that's what they want to do, that's fine. But I'm a 50-year-old grown-ass man, and now I'm wondering if I'm going to walk into a, 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 a puke storm. So of course they they do the puke cannon. They 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 fire off the 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 vomit cannon, and the uh, the one place they didn't cover was the ceiling, which is exactly where all the vomit went to. Because whatever they did to the leap roller, who knew it was not made to blow vomit out of it. There was some engineering problem. The 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 tragic man-child geniuses who reconfigured the the leaf blower to be a vomit cannon. I don't know. They missed something. So now there's vomit all over the ceiling and there's dripping white vomit from the ceiling. So what did I do? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I did. I said I I don't want to go in there. The entire hallway smells like puke, and it's just it's awful. This is like what what are you doing? And they're like, well, wait, they're figuring it out. They're figuring it out, man. They're going to put you in another studio. All right. So I go in the other studio. And the guy who hosts the show, he's a, he's a good radio guy. We did a very good interview. He's, you know, he's good. Good morning guy. And I go, what are you doing? What the hell are you doing with the vomit cannon? And he's like, well, you know, we just do stuff like, uh, like stuff you think about when you were younger that you, you just like, if you were younger, wouldn't you think that was cool? And I'm like, no, not in a fucking million years would I even think to do that. First of all, you don't even need the leaf blower. Just let the guy puke in the other guy's mouth if you want to have that weird <laughs> psycho homoerotic freak show going on. Just let the two guys in their underwear vomit in each other's mouths. What do you need a leaf blower for? At least it's more intimate like that. I didn't say all that. I said, no, I don't think I would have thought of that. I, I just don't know how it felt. It just felt like it was, it was, it was just desperate and stupid, which is fine, but who cares? And why has it come to that? I followed a vomit cannon. I can put that on my resume. That's all I'm saying. All right? Exercise is good for us. We go to the gym to take care of our bodies, or at least we should, but we should also work out another important asset, our brain. Lumosity.com can help. It's like an online gym for your brain. Lumosity has scientifically designed brain games customized to help train your memory. They challenge your attention and problem-solving skills. They're fun, and they only take a few minutes every day. Track your progress online and compare yourself to other people. Plus, you can play Lumosity from anywhere, your computer, your iPad, or your iPhone with the free Lumosity app. So have fun, work out your brain, and make Lumosity part of your everyday routine. I've been using it because I'm afraid of losing my mind. Start training your brain today. Go to Lumosity.com, click the Start Training button, then start playing your first game. That's Lumosity.com, and tell them you heard it on WTF. I don't know if I did justice to the vomit cannon, but boy, did I feel like, I felt like something was over. Just, you know, either inside of me, or the world, or radio, 
or entertainment. It just it it was just one of those things where you're like, you know what they they characterize hitting bottom when you hit bottom where nothing works anymore. Whatever you were doing, whatever you were hooked on, it just doesn't work anymore. And you know what? When you're in a radio station and you're running your morning show and you got a bunch of guys running around in their underwear like it's completely reasonable behavior. You're so insulated in the morning radio area. I know that. because You're, you're the only ones alive in a way, you and your crew. But when you're in there and everyone's like, well, what are we going to do? Uh, there's vomit dripping from the ceiling. That's bottom. You've hit bottom. Do you understand? That That's it. It's time to... It's time to quit something. Reconfigure, man. Okay, I'm going to order food right now, and I'm going to take care of it all online. Okay? That's what I'm going to do. Hold on. Hold on. I'm doing it. Hold on. Hold on. I'm doing it. Okay. I'm going to type in my... uh, I'm at grubhub.com. I'm typing in my address... Okay, and what would I like? Uh, I don't know, just find some restaurants. It's searching. Oh my God, I got choices. I got I got the anything button, I got Chinese, I got Thai, I got sushi, I got Mexican, I got Indian food, I got pizza, and I can just order from these places and they'll send them? That is amazing. There are over 40 restaurants that will deliver food to my house when I use Grubhub, and there are dozens in your area as well. All you do is log on, search for what you want, place your order, and get ready to eat without ever picking up the phone. Order online or through the Grubhub app. And Grubhub is free to use, folks. Go to grubhub.com slash WTF and use the code podcast during checkout to get five bucks off your first order over ten dollars. That's grubhub.com slash WTF. Use the code podcast at checkout. Grubhub.com. Yeah, Cosner was great in the movie. He was great. Well, you had a chance to see it. I'm I, happy. I yeah. sat down and watched the movie. I was oh, not wow. like, I mean, I've watched <laughs> most of your movies. We Thank grew God. up with most of the movies, and uh, it. Uh, you know, I teared up. I thought Cosner did a great job. Thank you. Uh, it's called Draft Day. Draft, Draft Day. Yeah, Is that, that's what As it's in called. The right? NFL Draft. You that's know. right. I don't know anything about football. I know nothing. And did it work for you? Yeah, it worked for me because it's a story. It's a human story it, it, about business, about politics, it, it, politics in terms of business. We watch a lot of movies where we don't know. Really, the subject matter. Like, yeah, we don't have to know about how to how to operate a nuclear plant. You know? Yeah, and uh, we get involved in in the tension of those kinds of situations. Sure, it's going to blow up. Oh my God, what are going to do about it? And they got to do this. Right, but we don't also we also don't watch a nuclear plant every Sunday to see if it's going to blow. <laughs> But uh, yeah, well, that's an interesting. <laughs> I mean, analogy maybe maybe we totally should. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I was it was very compelling, and I thought uh, Cosner did an amazing job playing that character. Like I, I forget what a great actor he is. Yeah, you know, uh, he's not had an opportunity to stretch those muscles. I think in a while. Yeah, and uh, he's done some smaller roles just lately. Uh huh. And here he gets to go full flower. Yeah. Again. And he makes mistakes. I think that's one of the cool things about having a hero that makes mistakes and then sort of takes the whole movie to sort of fight his way out of it, hopefully. I mean, you've been a filmmaker for, what, how long now, 35, 40 years? Yeah, if you include the really early ones, the, the I think the first one was Cannibal Girls. Uh-huh. We made for $12,000. I don't think I saw that one. <laughs> you is should that, is it available i think it is yeah. on videotape somewhere uh-huh but um i think if you looked online you could find it i'm not so sure it's such a good idea but <laughs> what, um, what, what was cannibal girls about um well it's it's eugene levy and andrea martin yeah they're the stars long before sctv right and, and all the movies that you got yeah, to yeah. love them with right uh you know we were all growing up in canada and toronto and you know, we thought, hey, let's make a movie. I'd done a few shorts. I knew them because we were all hanging around in Toronto. And, you know, let's improvise a feature. Yeah. So from SCTV, that's where we know them from and from the yes, Christopher Guest is, movies. That's right. But this is like... They're kids. Yeah, this is like 15 or years before those movies, I guess. Well, how Maybe. old were they? Were they 20? I mean... Yeah. yeah. Something like that. <laughs> okay. Late teens or early 20s, somewhere in that range. And 
Yeah, we were all in college or just out of college. Right. Yeah. So I think I raised twelve thousand uh-huh. dollars. Uh huh. Two for me, or actually my father, I think, and um, and five other people put in two thousand dollars each. That's, yeah. That's how we did it, and it, it was harder to make movies then than it is today, actually, because um, the technology is all here. Every, or most people have computers. Most people have cameras that shoot really good. Yeah, right. Digital stuff. So, yeah, and it syncs sound. You don't have to have an extra guy to right. do sound. <laughs> right. Um, and there was you had to have a crew. You yeah. had to have a crew. You had to buy thirty-five millimeter film, which is really expensive. And so um, you know we negotiated. But the real problem is that's the movie I found out. Oh yeah, it's good to have a script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though yeah. they're very talented improv people. Um. You know, didn't all quite add up when we edited it together, and yeah, spent the year reshooting and reshooting until it sort of made this weird, goofy <laughs> sense. And when you're shooting improvised footage, I mean, who know, how, how do you know when to stop? When you run out of film? When you run out of budget? I mean, um, yeah, it, that's it. Sort of the, was the beginning of my training process as a director, just sort of trying to organize that kind of uh, improvisation. And I know that seems like, you know, it fights that idea, but so it's talking to them, saying cut, you know, having another conversation, doing another take, uh-huh. uh, learning how to do coverage in a situation like that. And it's interesting because now that, you know, that's fairly common in TV production and, and in some movies. I mean, I mean, Christopher Guest shoots like that. I don't think a lot of people shoot like that, but certainly there are some television models now that, that only do that. Like yeah. Larry, you know, like, uh, yeah, Larry David does that. Yes. And yeah, but I think they outline really carefully. They they know where those stories are going, right? And then you know, so they have a premise for each scene, you know, that yeah. adds up into a structure that they've already agreed on, right? And you know, they're just really good. So yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> that, true. That also helps. <laughs> yeah. So Cannibal was the was the first film thing you did. Yeah, I mean, I did a short in college um, called Orientation just really a precursor to Animal House. It was about the first couple of days in college of a freshman student. Uh-huh. He, uh, you know, and it, it was like a propaganda film for for the clubs at uh, the university. It was, turned out to be really funny. And uh, actually, it showed at a film festival. F- uh, somebody from Fox Canada saw it, thought it was great because it got a great response. And... Um, they put up the money. They blew it up to thirty-five, and it played in movie theaters, like for really. It was on the head of the. I don't know if you remember the movie John and Mary. It starred Mia Farrow, Mary, yeah. and uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman. I right know. after the Graduate, it was like a second movie, and uh, everyone thought, "Oh, this is going to be a big hit." Uh, unfortunately for them, Orientation got way more laughs. <laughs>, laughs. Was John and Mary a comedy? I think so. I have no <laughs> idea what that movie is. Well, look it up. Oh my God! It's like one of those like those are big names, and so it didn't yes. really didn't make the canon of must see movies. No, not that year, but it was great for or my film because it, my film looked so good. I always got applause at the end of it, which was kind of amazing for a little short. But yeah, it well, was my beginning. Well, was that was that always the plan? I mean, where you, you grew up entirely in Canada? Well, Czechoslovakia yeah. until five. My parents and I escaped. It literally escaped. Literally, bottom of the boat. Escape. Tell me what that means, bottom of the boat. I got some of this information from your son, but I'd like to hear it from you. I'd, um, you know, I think they were going to, uh, uh, you know, it's the communists were running, uh, Stalinist communism in 1950. So they pushed the Germans out. Well, I mean, this, they, this is now four years after the Germans are gone. And and, 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 and it's occupied by basically Russia. Uh-huh. Um, and that that's when... The Czech Republic and Slovakia were a country called Czechoslovakia. Right. And, um, you know, my my father was just a real good capitalist and uh, had built up some business businesses. He was doing vinegar and stuff like that, making vinegar, uh-huh. the biggest vinegar guy in, in Czechoslovakia. <laughs> yeah. He, when the communists came into the country, I mean, they were always there, but when they basically took over the government, which was, I think, in forty nine. You know, they put my father in charge of all the vinegar factories uh, to supervise them. But he knew it was only a matter of time before he was arrested like his brother had been arrested, you know, for, you know, because he was not a member of the party. And 
and they were planning to leave uh, all this time, and they were secretly converting uh, Czech crowns to American dollars. Your father was, yeah, you know, uh, which was illegal. Yeah, and um, but it was a way to get hard currency to to help us get out. And huh, and sort of one July day, you know, I was calling. I was hanging out with my friends, and I was, I think, five. Yeah, and they said, oh, I'll, I remember saying to this kid I was playing with, "Well, I'll see you after dinner." And yeah, and the next thing I knew, I was putting on like four pairs of pants and shirts, and because it. We could. They figured we couldn't make. Uh, we had to be secretive, and yeah, uh, we took only one suitcase. I kept trying to put my favorite toy was a slide projector. Ironically enough, uh-huh. uh, with um, Disney cartoon characters like Mickey Mouse, uh-huh. Donald Duck on them. Yeah, and I just loved that damn thing. And I just it was a big chunky thing that weighed about five pounds. <laughs> I yeah. kept trying to put it into <laughs> this tiny suitcase and. Um, I actually thought I snuck it in at the end because my mother would just keep saying, "Look, we have to go for a, a long time. We don't have room to take that." And anyway, to make a very long story short, the um, we stuck ourselves onto a uh, this boat. I mean, we had made they had made a deal with the captain, uh-huh. paid him some hard currency to to uh, nail us down in the hold of uh, the boat to put the floor on top of you. That's right. So because they, those boats were all inspected by the the communists. Yeah, well, by the Russian soldiers sure. over there. Yeah. So we got out. We got to Vienna. Um, How long was that? Do you have any I, recollection? I, I don't know. So I think it was overnight. I know I was down there because there was no bathrooms or anything. And right. They had given me a sleeping pill, and they actually given me too much. Yeah. And so when they finally put the candle on to see what was up. Um, I was out cold, but my eyes were open like I was a dead guy. And uh, <laughs> needless to say, I wasn't dead. Yeah. Uh, but it scared the crap out of my parents. Uh-huh. Um, we got to Vienna. From Vienna, we got to France where we had an uncle. Um, my um, mother's brothers lived there. We yeah. We stayed there for six months until we got a visa to immigrate to Canada where we had another uncle. Wow. And they started from nothing. You know, they didn't uh, speak the language, literally had no money. How they, how they avoid the Germans? Oh, I, that's an earlier story. But, yeah, they. my mother was in Auschwitz um, and managed to survive that because uh, she was in for the last year, but uh, she was young and strong and got out. And uh, oh my, my father God. was a kind of a freedom fighter guy, and he was running around, you know, killing people. Really? Yeah, and just staying in the woods. And Freedom Fighter, uh, uh, that, I saw a movie about that. It's unbelievable. Yeah, so it's all, uh, it's amazing what we are the products of and how we end up making comedy movies that become famous in America. <laughs> it's a, it's just an interesting See, a journey we go down. Right, so your parent, like, your father has this amazing, you know, determination, clearly. Yeah, they both did. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. my mother was actually the braver one, I yeah. think. It was her idea to escape. Yeah, she was in Auschwitz. And it, what were you told about that as a kid? Uh, you know, it wasn't good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they get to where? From Montreal? No, we got to, well, we landed in Halifax. Yeah. And quickly came to Toronto where my um, my uncle and aunt and cousin were. And, uh, you know, we lived with them for a month or two. And then finally we got our own little apartment. My father went to work as a presser. My mother, you know, was very handy um, seamstress mm-hmm. and you know did she did piecework mm-hmm. and it was immediately pregnant with my sister's twins uh-huh and you know that's how they started their life there and what end, what business did he end up uh, going into did he stay a printer or presser or what happened well he ended up buying a dry cleaning store yeah and, and then a couple of them and then he sold those and he eventually bought this car wash property that has now become quite famous because you know, we converted it first to a parking lot after, um, you know, after he worked very hard on it. And it, it's now the home of the Toronto Film Festival, you know, where we built this. Uh, we contributed it, the family did, yeah. uh, to honor our parents uh-huh. you know, to uh, as the home of the of the Bell Lightbox, this lovely sort of film palace in, oh, wow. in the center of yeah. the city. That's beautiful. 
Thank you. Yeah. And, and so was he, was the original, I, so he stayed, he didn't get back into vinegar, which is probably good. No, he tried to. Yeah. It wouldn't let him in. <laughs> you know, you had to, cause the vinegar involves alcohol and things like that. And, um, it's, it was, there was no way to, it was a kind of fixed business in Ontario. It was tough. It was run by the, you know, by, you know, by agencies that you had to know how to yeah. maneuver. And he was just an, immigrant guy who could barely speak english and had no real money so there's no way to get there how did were they able to see your successes yes i'm happy to say yeah they uh you know you know i went to school i put on i had a music group i thought i was i always wanted to be a film composer yeah and so i went into um, i studied music in college and then i started making films and um your orientation gonna... was actually the, the one i was just talking about yeah. it was the first film and, you know, they hung in there. They, my father clearly was the guy who said, hey, look, why don't you go into law <laughs> or or something like that, or accountancy or architecture. He was very concerned about yeah. how are you going to make a living in the music business. Uh-huh. And, and, but, you, but that was your dream? The, initially you wanted to be in, uh, you were in a band? Well, I want to be in the arts yeah. somehow. I had a, you know, I started in a kind of folk singing group. It was the 60s after all. Uh-huh. And, um... You know, it was um, the great uh, Chris Guest movie was it a mighty win? A mighty win, yeah. Sort of really brought back memories. Yeah, <laughs> that was my life. <laughs> well, well, Jason said he remembers you uh, playing guitar, and and that he's very moved by it all. And that he he, he came in here and saw my guitars, and he's like, I have my dad's guitar. <laughs> he so, does. He's really sweet about that. <laughs> it made a big impression on him. Yeah, he never heard my group because my group <laughs> start, stopped playing. Long before he was born. Yeah. But um, it was a beginning. And, yeah. you know, we played the local folk clubs on weekends, mm -hmm. you know, in between. This was during high school. And start, and continued to do it into university, but I quickly, you know, got involved in the performance arts. But, there, you know, there were no uh, film classes. Yeah. Uh, the, they were non-existent in, right. the, in the late 60s. Uh, maybe down here they started, but not where I was. We didn't even know what a film director did, right. and uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I just sort of learned by doing. And your 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 father initially he wasn't supportive. Did he become supportive at some point? Yeah, he became very. He knew somehow that um, that I needed a future in the arts. Uh huh. Uh, you know, um, and so he he actually became very supportive. Came to everything I did. Uh huh. And because um, he saw you had a passion for it. I guess, and um, I was also very ent entrepreneurial, uh -huh. and uh, he he kind of got it. He understood the uh, sense of risk. I mean, these are pe people who risked everything a number of times in their lives, right? And survived and did very well. Yeah. Did he ever Did he ever say anything to you that was uh, you, you you know that that gave you a certain amount of faith? I mean, was there a point where I, I imagine they be initially they're afraid for your future? Well, you know? surely. He, yeah. No, it's. He he was not really happy when I went into music. Yeah, but l much later, and Jason may have told the story because uh, he he now tells this story much better than I do. I yeah, mean, I think uh, after attending a kind of course in Montreal in 1967, I came home very excited to tell my dad. You know, they got these subway shops, subway sandwiches. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> very common right now, but it was a really unique thing, and there weren't any in uh, Toronto. And yeah. I said, wouldn't it be great? Like you could put up a little bit of money, I'll I'll run it, and I think we can do really well. And you know, he looked at me kindly, and he said, <laughs> "I'm sure if you wanted to run a Subway sandwich shop, you'd do extraordinarily well, but there's not enough magic in it for you." Right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and I told that story to Jason when he was sort of in pre med uh -huh. uh, at Skidmore, yeah. and uh, it was clearly miserable. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I wasn't even—I didn't even know he was interested in movies. You know? Yeah, yeah. He was on the set of Animal House when he was like thirteen or fourteen days old, and he'd been on all my sets because uh, uh, I tried to make it a point when I was directing, at least, to shoot during the summertime when yeah. the kids were available, and, my, and um, my wife could all—you know—we could just set up camp right. wherever we were. Yeah, yeah. But. Uh, so he was always around it, and I was always pissed because he didn't seem to pay any attention to me. <laughs> you know, he was so much more interested in what everyone else was doing. Right. And um, I actually thought he was just goofing off. Right. And um, 
He wasn't. He yeah. was really paying attention. Yeah, it, it sounded like it to me. You know, he's very thoughtful about his process, and I have to assume a lot of that he learned from you, uh, one way or the other. Whether he was paying yes. attention to you or not, <laughs> it certainly had an impact. <laughs> you know, It was remarkable when he first came back to USC after I told him the, uh, the magical Subway sandwich story and uh, and told him, look, it's okay if you don't want to be a doctor. Yeah. Um, you know, Go into the arts. You only get to go around once and yeah. and uh, do something that you love. And uh, he decided to quit, and he talked his way into USC. And he, I don't know if he told you the story of his. He initially, as soon as he got back, he raised a, about eight thousand dollars selling advertising to the local uh, kind of shops that are around USC. No, he didn't tell me that. Uh, he he had a desk calendar mm-hmm. uh, that he invented that he was going to lay down and on the desks of uh, every freshman incoming student in the uh, yeah in the dorms and uh, so he went to the local dry cleaning store to the pizza place and said look I'm going to be doing this I'm going to distribute 2000 of them and here's the cost for this little square and yeah. you'll be on, you'll be that square on every page and so when they want pizza they're going to call you and he sold it out and yeah. he he profited it and he netted out about 8 grand I said, so Jason, what are you going to do with the eight grand? I was really proud of him yeah. for raising all this money. Yeah. I said, well, I'm going to I'm going to direct the movie. I said, you want to direct? It's <laughs> <laughs> so really the first time I realized he was kind of interested in the movies. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, you know, it's I think the mo- first movie was Operation, I think. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it's short, and then went on to um, you know when everything had entered into. Yeah. It. That's a, that must have been a proud moment for you. Oh, it was extraordinary. I, see, not only the write and direct, and really did a spectacular job of it, um, but he, he had the initiative to actually go raise the money. I think my wife and I, when we, we heard that um, um, that he had raised the 8000 I think we, we contributed a few thousand. I said, well, you'll probably need a little bit more, so here's a couple of grand. <laughs> yeah. And um, But he just... Um, you know, he really did it all himself. Uh huh. Do, do you think he had something to prove to you? I think he had something to prove to himself. It's yeah. what you finally have to do. Yeah. When you when you got done with uh, with college and you were, you had a music focus and you made the first film, I mean, what what brought you around to directing? What jobs did you do in show business? <laughs> you know that that you uh, had you arrive at what you became. Well, college was a very kind of creative, ex- explosively creative time for me. Where I was a crappy high school student, some somehow by the time I got to college, um, I decided I was just going to do well both in school and and also get involved in the school. And that that for me meant like I got you know I was reviewing it the, for the newspaper. I I started directing in the dramatic society. These weren't all courses. This was because there were no course. Right. arts courses in the school it was really like clubs they were clubs yeah. you know um, funded by the student society right from student fees so and you're directing plays and I writing did, for I the did paper. plays i did a musical i did a full scale version of little abner directing uh, yeah directing it and um and i started i really liked it and there was a film club and because i had done so well on the other clubs the film club had gone bankrupt as film clubs tend to do mm-hmm. and um I sort of convinced the student council to sort of lend me a little bit, you know, to fund it a little bit, and uh-huh. then I would turn it around. Yeah. And I put two clubs together. I I put the Film Society, which showed films, and the Filmmaking Club, the board, yeah. the film board together, and and the, movie, the money that we received from showing films went to pay for the movies that we made, kind yeah. of a really... The Hollywood system, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. and just instituted there at McMaster University, and it was very successful, and um, and through that I made that first film that I spoke about orientation. And after college, what did you start doing immediately? I actually started distributing films. I forgot about that. I um, I had met when I was out trying to sell Cannibal Girls. I met Bob Shea, who ran Uline uh, Uline Cinema, uh-huh. now a very famous company. Yeah. And um, and I became his Canadian distributor. Really? Yeah, I remember. And we his first the first movie they had was Sympathy Sympathy for the Devil. Jean Luc Godard directed. Sure. 
It's a weird Roll- movie. Yeah, the with yeah. the Rolling Stones doing Sympathy for the Devil. It's like intercut with uh, Radicals, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a goofy movie. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> not your not your thing, huh? <laughs> well, it was sort of my thing. Uh-huh. I love the Stones part of it. Yeah, actually, sure, and, sure. And watching them in a recording studio. Yeah. But I thought Godard generally was pretty pretentious. But the um, I'm going to get letters about that, or you will. Oh, you think so? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> if, if look, if someone's writing us letters about what you say about Godard, I got a good audience. <laughs> you sure do. <laughs> you know, you know, it was just um, we would take it to universities and show it on. Basically, what I was doing in college is what I started doing. We would do these one night four wall deals mm-hmm. where we split the take with. With the college, part to us, part back to New New Line yeah. in, in New York, and that was really it. Allowed me to have a one room office, yeah, and sort of get going on stuff, and sort of that's from there we did Cannibal Girls, I and, guess. And you did, and you stopped doing live stuff, or you did, you know? No, I uh, Doug Henning, the star, one of the stars of Little Abner, and who I went to school with at McMaster, the magician. What was his Broadway show? It was the Magic Show. The ma- I saw that. Yeah, well, I produced it. I actually started. <laughs> um, I was a kid. Yes. Yeah. I was barely a kid. And um, it, the story of the Magic Show started as a show called Spellbound. Yeah. Which, again, being entrepreneurial, I, I talked to a man named Ed Mervish who, had, who ran the Royal Alexandra Theater, a beautiful theater, legit theater, just down the street from the car wash. Yeah. And... Um, I talked him into giving us two weeks at Christmas time to do this special magic uh-huh. show, and it all yeah. came. I'm I'm telling the story backwards, yeah. but the because um, I had also my only job ever was to work for about six months on a startup cable television network uh, tel- television station called City TV. And yeah, I was doing two shows there every week. One was. Sweet City Women, which was a talk show five days a week yeah, uh, for women. Sweet City Women. Yeah. And yeah. Um, the second show was a show called Greed, <laughs> which was a 90-minute live <laughs> program on Saturday night starting at 8 o'clock against yeah. the hockey game. Right. Where God knows what we did, but it was a $500 budget, and there were sketches. There was, you know, Bikini Girls of the Week. And yeah. there, was stu- there was an audience of sort of geriatric people that we picked up from the local old folks and you, home. And you were running the station? I was running that show. Oh, I was okay. the producer, director yeah. of that show. Anyway, Doug Henning, who I knew from school, appeared on the talk show. And yeah. I said, and we went out for coffee after. I said, so what do you want to do? Because uh, I knew he was doing, like, magic all around the place. And he said, well, if I could raise some money to do these big illusions, I'd like to do kind of, I was going to go on tour with a rock group and do these theatrical events with rock music and uh-huh. and magic. And I said, well, that sounds like a, going to be expensive to go from place to place. Why don't we do it as a kind of a theatrical show? Yeah. And he said, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And he just wanted you know somebody <laughs> to raise money for him. Right. And um, I was able to do that. Um, and we started this show. And amazingly... Um, David Cronenberg yeah, the, the wrote the book. I directed and produced. Howard Shore, who be the musical director of Saturday Night Live, SNL, yeah. about five years later, yeah. um, was my composer slash... Uh, These are all Canadian guys. All all living together in Toronto at this moment. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and uh, Paul Schaefer, uh-huh. the, the sure. great pianist, yeah. and, uh, from, he was our band leader really yes and this is the show that went on and then we did this really complex lovely show with magic tricks and stuff and that eventually became the magic show that you saw on broadway that's crazy and so this is schaefer's first gig it's shore's first gig it's uh it was was my first foray into something like i had never done before and we ended up in new york now they all the magic show got totally converted into the show that you saw, which right. was, was frankly a much goofier show than mm-hmm. what we did. I just remember him walking around the stage with his like long hair. And, That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it was the same illusions. Uh-huh. <laughs> really, what 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 stuck was the magic, and, right? And uh, they built this other a book around it with another comp- actually Stephen Schwartz, the famous composer, did Pippin and Godspell, did the music for the magic show. But I got to hang around as the. 
they wouldn't let me direct it because I'd uh, not done much. Right. And um, but I produced it, co-produced it, and that was a big hit. Five years. That's on. Un- that's unreal. Yeah. And how did you? How did you meet all these other? You know, like the the guys that are, are usually associated with Second City, and and you know. I knew the Second City guys because we were all growing up. To a lot of them were in Canada. So, you right. know, Dan Aykroyd, for example, was the announcer on Greed, the show I was just talking Come about. Come on. And, uh. <laughs> he's doing it straight or is it No, he was part? funny. He yeah. was funny. You know, he, uh, we'd just make up the show in the uh-huh. afternoon, on Saturday afternoon, and there we were live. And uh, you guys are what, 20 years old? We were in our sort of mid 20s by uh-huh. now. We were uh-huh. sort of early 20s, somewhere in there. Yeah. And, um, now what happened is, I had want having now directed Cannibal Girls. I wanted to do, and I had I had produced a couple of horror movies as yeah. well in the meantime. Uh, for, for David, for David Cronenberg, Car- which yeah. ones? Uh, Shivers and Rabbit. Oh, yeah, well, those are early. Those are crazy. The yeah. first two. Yeah, yeah. 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 He had, I actually had directed more than he did mm-hmm. uh, by the time he was, but he'd written this wonderful script called Orgy of the Blood Parasites, which was Shivers. Yeah. And um, did you retitle it? Uh, Shivers, yeah, actually, I think it was my title. And, um, and it was my brilliant idea to bring Marilyn Chambers as the star of Rabbit. And, um, because <laughs> I was living in New York quite a bit. Um, and I'd seen her. Uh, there used to be a really funny talk show on. Robin Bird? Or, or it was something like or the Goldstein show. It was, was it? The, it was the one where they interviewed people in the, in in the naked, new, in the right. naked yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I saw her being interviewed, and she's really smart, actually, yeah. and and lovely. Yeah. And I said, why not Why not her in, uh, as the star of Rabbit? It would make be good for us. We were making it for like 100 grand. and uh, Bring a and different audience in. <laughs> well, it, it would give us notoriety. Right. You know, for $100,000, sure. you don't get to... A lot of press. Yeah, right, you got right. a lot of press. And it was right. just a kind of a way of um, bringing attention to that project, and it worked. Yeah, and, and uh, so you're still friends with Cronenberg, I imagine? Yeah, yeah. Be, uh, I saw him just about a year ago. I don't, I don't see him a lot anymore because he lives in Toronto still uh-huh. and, and uh, made his career there. Extraordinary, wonderful career. So how 